Good morning, everyone. I'm going to call the Assembly Committee on Judiciary to order on this Friday morning. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod? Here. Assemblywoman Cohen? Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Here. Assemblywoman Hansen? Assemblywoman Hardy? Assemblywoman Kasama? Here. Assemblywoman Krasner? Here. Assemblywoman Marzola? Here. Assemblyman Miller? Here. Assemblywoman Wynn? Here. Assemblyman O'Neill? Here. Assemblyman Orentlicker? Here. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong? Here. Assemblyman Wheeler? Chairman Yeager? Here. Here. Please mark Assemblyman Wheeler and Assemblywoman Hansen absent excused this morning. Everybody else is present. That means we do have a quorum. One moment. The gremlins are out Friday already, so uh, again, good morning to committee members. Good morning to those joining us in the room. We seem to have a full room this morning, which is very exciting for a Friday morning. And good morning to those on the Zoom and those who may be watching on the internet or the legislature's YouTube channel. We have arrived at day 82 of the 81st session of the Nevada legislature. Before we get started this morning, just a few housekeeping matters. For those of you in the room with us, could you please silence your electronic devices? If you intend to testify at this morning's hearing and you're here in Carson City, when you come to the table to testify, could you please remember to turn the microphone on to state your name before you speak and then to turn the microphone off when you're done speaking. If you're on the Zoom with us today, please mute yourself until you are ready to speak. And for everybody who's presenting or testifying today, please state your name before you speak, particularly when you answer questions. That will help our committee secretaries prepare accurate minutes and it'll make my job a little bit easier in reviewing those minutes. We do expect courtesy and respect in our interactions with one another. We don't always agree on policy, that's perfectly okay. We just need to make sure we're being respectful of one another, of the legislative process, and most importantly, our very hardworking staff. And then finally, many members up here on the dais are using multiple devices to access this morning's meeting. So please don't see it as a sign of disrespect or inattention if members appear to be looking away at times during the meeting. All right, with that behind us, we're going to move on to our agenda. I do intend to take the bills in the order as listed on the agenda. That might be a first this session, but we'll see how it goes. So at this time, I'm gonna open up the hearing on Senate Bill 108 in its first reprint. That bill establishes provisions relating to juvenile justice. We have Chair Scheibel with us, uh, Chair Senator Scheibel with us from the Senate Judiciary Committee. And we also have uh, former Senator Wiener with us on the Zoom and two of our youth legislators who are going to all help present this bill. So I wanna wish you all a very happy Friday morning. Welcome to Assembly Judiciary. We'll give you a chance to make the presentation then I'm sure we'll have some questions. So please go ahead. Thank you so much, Chair Yeager, and thank you, members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Melanie Scheibel. I am the State Senator for District 9, and it is my absolute pleasure to be here with the members of the Nevada Youth Legislature to present SB 108. I hope you're all familiar with the Youth Legislature. They are a fantastic group of young people who get together every year to talk about policy, learn about our process, and as far as we know, they are the only youth legislature in the country that gets an actual bill draft request to create real policy for Nevadans. And this year they are presenting SB 108. I am proud as the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee to have shepherded the bill through our committee. Um, it is technically a committee bill for the Senate Judiciary Committee. That's why it has the SB in front of it. But it is the work of these two young women who have um, really put their heart and soul into crafting some good policy that addresses issues of cultural competence for people who work with, pe with young people in the juvenile justice system. And I'm going to let them explain the bill and um, walk you through it. I do want to note that it has been amended, so I, f I hope that you are all looking at the first reprint. The original version of the bill addressed more than just the people involved in the juvenile justice system, but the reprint um, narrows the focus to uh, people within the juvenile justice system. And with that, and with your permission, Chair, I will turn it over to our youth legislators. I'm not sure who's going first, but I'm sure they will tell you. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair Senator Steibel. Oh, please go ahead. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Chair Senator Scheibel. Good morning, members of the Assembly Committee on Judiciary. For the record, I am Malik Te Halemisko, representing Senate District 9. I currently serve as chair of the Nevada Youth Legislature. With me today is Youth Legislator Juliana Melendez, representing Senate District 10. She first proposed the juvenile justice measure, which was which, which we selected as our bill to be introduced during the 81st session of the Nevada Legislature. I am appearing before you today primarily to share some background information about how the NYL selected this measure as its one statutorily provided bill. Youth Legislator Melendez will walk you through the details of the bill. Before I explain the history of the NYL BDR, I would like to share my own personal history with discrimination and the fear that it has created in my life. I was born in Ethiopia and I came to America when I was two years old. I'm the proud child of two hardworking parents who immigrated halfway across the world to ensure a better life. Unfortunately, they were unaware that the dream of a better life America sold came with the package deal of systemic oppression. The first memory I have of being exposed to, to, to society's true colors was after the death of Trayvon Martin. It was just two days after my ninth birthday when I noticed my mom's eyes were bloodshot red and Niagara Falls rolling down her cheeks. She pointed at our television and explained to me that an innocent 17-year-old African-American was murdered. From that day on, I began to see the world for what it truly was. My heart filled with fear every time my father stepped, stepped outside the house. I transitioned to fearing the police rather than feeling protected by them. Being in a position to prevent younger generations from fearing police has steered me towards law. For that reason, I seized the opportunity to be a Nevada youth legislator. This bill gives the youth the opportunity to live life without fear of being victimized by implicit bias. Senate Bill 108 is significant because it requires any criminal justice employees to complete implicit bias and cultural competency training, which is highly crucial in a world where systemic racism is normalized and bias is inevitable. Any action that can be taken to reduce implicit bias and work towards a more educated group of, of employees will overall reduce the fear and stigma that is associated with the justice system. The bill that the NYL chose is one that we are confident will improve the quality of life for youth in Nevada. Thank you greatly, Madam Chair and members of the Judicial Committee for listening to my testimony and considering Senate Bill 108. Again, before Youth Legislator Melendez explains the NYL bill, our intention with the measure and the, and the benefits that it will deliver, I would like to describe how we, as the Nevada Youth Legislature, chose Senate Bill 108 for introduction. On September 2nd, 2020, all 18 youth legislators participated in a comprehensive midterm training on the BDR development. We learned about drafting language, fiscal impacts, advocacy, and much more. Prior to the next meeting and training, all 18 youth legislators submitted their individual ideas for NYL's one statutorily provided bill. During the October 13th meeting, each youth, each, each youth legislator presented his or her own proposal and answered questions posed by their NYL colleagues. During that meeting, we started with 18 measures then narrowed it down to seven and then the top two BDRs for further consideration at our November meeting. Of those two BDRs, one focused on annual mental health screenings for school age children. The other addressed discrimin discriminatory inequities in the juvenile justice system. By the time we came together for the November 19th meeting, youth legislators were eager to learn more about these two remaining BDRs during full legislative hearings with five expert witnesses for each measure. After comprehensive testimonies and careful Q&A, 
With these witnesses, the NYL selected the Juvenile Justice PDR proposed by Youth Legislator Melendez. In January 2021, the NYL met to refine the bill. During our meeting, we worked with legal division to clarify any questions or concerns and fine tune the language. Senate Bill 108 was introduced in the Senate and referred to the Senate Committee on Judiciary on February 9th, 2021. On March 16th, 2021, the Senate Committee on Judiciary heard testimony regarding Senate Bill 108. After, hearing, after the hearing, the NYL facilitated a conference call so the concerned parties could discuss suggested suggestions for refining the bill with an amendment. The amendment was submitted to the Senate Committee on Judiciary and was passed as amended on April 2nd, 2021. The Senate passed the amended bill on April 15th, 2021. Senate Bill 108 was introduced to the Assembly on April 16th, 2021. Unfortunately, the NYL has not had the opportunity to discuss or vote anything beyond what was originally included in Senate Bill 108. Therefore, neither Youth Legislator Melendez nor I will be able to take position on behalf of the NYL on the amendment or any proposed changes going forward. However, we can provide committee members with the perspective of how the NYL discussed and, and processed Senate Bill 108. This includes the ideas and concerns that youth legislators shared during decision making and language development of this bill. In addition to this, youth legislator Melendez and I can answer any questions and share input as individual youth legislators. It is now again my privilege to introduce Youth Legislator Juliana Melendez to help you better understand the need for Senate Bill 108 and why this NYL proposed legislative measure powerfully addresses our concerns and about discriminatory inequities in the juvenile justice system. Following Youth Legislator Melendez, Melendez's presentation, each of us look forward to answering any questions that the members of the committee might have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Ms. Melendez, when you're ready, please go ahead. Good morning. For the record, I am Youth Legislator Juliana Melendez representing Senate District 10. I appear before you today uh, as the original sponsor of the BDR selected by the Nevada Youth Legislature as its 2021 legislative measure, SB 108. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today before the Assembly Judiciary Committee. We are all here because we care about the future of Nevada. Whether we have children, grandchildren, younger relatives, or our youth ourselves, we have a personal responsibility to protect those who will continue our legacies. In order to fully carry out this duty of protection, we cannot ignore the fact that minority youth are amongst the most vulnerable within our communities, and this vulnerability leaves them open to discrimination based solely upon their race. This is extremely prevalent within our juvenile justice system. Nevada has the sixth highest rate of student arrests in the nation, and within the last three years, Black youth accounted for 43% of police referrals while only making up 17% of the student body. In Clark County specifically, Black and Brown youths make up 76% of all juvenile cases referred to the district attorney's office. I will be providing a printed copy of these statistics and more for review prior to the committee's work session. The two major components of SB 108 that seek to address these alarming statistics are the mandatory racial and cultural competency trainings for all workers in the uh, juvenile justice system who come into contact with juveniles. Um, and I completely understand that the state budget is tight at the moment, which is why I'd like to offer some insight into how this bill could be implemented with as little cost as possible. 
So an example of a concept comparable to SB 108 that was successfully implemented in Nevada is restorative justice. For restorative justice, community organizations advocated and provided the framework for this within schools during the last legislative session and assisted in the implementation of it. By having outside organizations provide the framework and work with school social workers, the restorative justice trainings became characteristically pro bono. Some specific community organizations that actually would help with funding and or provide free trainings needed for SB 108's uh, successful implementation are the NAACP and ACLU. A suggestion that was made at one of the most recent NYL meetings was actually collaborating with the State Bar of Nevada, who already requires attorneys to take certain trainings on a yearly basis. By collaborating with them, we would be able to have the trainings mandated in SB 108, possibly required by the State Bar, which would help with any possible costs. Grants from the Federal Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention are also a possibility, given the necessity for the assistance of external organizations. Lastly, the state of Nevada spends 2.7 times as much per prisoner as per public school student. And with less students in the juvenile justice system, we can allocate these funds towards community needs. In today's current political climate, it is urgent more so now than ever to address the inequality faced by minority youth within the Nevada juvenile justice system. I personally have friends who have been targeted by school police and treated differently compared to our white counterparts, specifically because of the color of their skin. This firsthand experience of racial discrimination against my peers, as well as the recent uproar worldwide concerning racism and ethnic disparities are what inspired me to create this bill. Personally, I have been fairly uh, judged by police officers due to how I look. It ranges from stares to indifferent tones. I can feel the apathy from the police as if I am less valuable, insignificant. I can say with certainty that people of uh, that are black, black and brown are looked upon differently compared to my white peers. The anxiety I see in my black uh, and brown peers eyes whenever the police is present as we walk down the school hallway will always remain ingrained in my mind. At one of our last NYL meetings, a student actually shared her encounter with an LVMPD officer who accused her of being involved with a crime simply because she was Black. We cannot allow instances like these to keep occurring in Nevada. By supporting SB 108, we are able to prevent thousands of our youth from ending up in a system that leaves them psychologically, physically, and mentally traumatized. Juvenile incarceration can also contribute to the higher rates of fatal drug overdose, suicide, and post-traumatic stress later on in life. While I understand that school districts and police departments have the best interests of students in mind, the recent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Rayshard Brooks clearly illustrate the potential dangers of police interactions, and that is why we need to be the first to address this undercover pandemic of racial disparities in our juvenile justice system. Let us not wait for 10 years to pass so that we can try and help those whose incarceration we should have prevented. Let's take action for our youth today, not tomorrow. Once again, thank you to the committee for this opportunity. Please direct any questions you may have to either myself or Chair Haley Miskell. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you and to Chair Scheibel for your presentation this morning. A committee, we're now going to take some questions, and we'll start with Assemblywoman Bilbray Axelrod, and then we'll go to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you very much, um, Chair Yeager, and thank you, Senator, for bringing this bill. And I'm always so amazed to see our youth legislators and their poise and the work they have done on this bill, and that is very apparent, so thank you. My question is, um, you, many of your examples, you actually use the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and I was looking in your bill and, and you say regular and routine contact, and I was just wondering how you would define that. And anybody can take that. <laughs> Uh, 
I will weigh in here. This is Senator Melanie Scheibel for the record. And um, the language that you see in the amended bill represents a consensus with the Supreme Court, the Division of Child and Family Services, the um, DA Juvenile Divisions, and uh, Juvenile Parole and Probation. And so um, my, I left that conversation understanding that the Division of Child and Family Services, so all of the CPS and DCFS employees who regularly interact with youth would be included in this, as well as the juvenile probation officers and school police officers. Um, we could check with legal, but it was my understanding that it would not encompass all of Metro. Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I also am always very impressed with our youth legislators, and I'm um, really happy to see you, Senator Weiner. Um, and uh, it's good to have you here, Chair uh, Scheibel. Um, so my question, um, youth legislator Melendez touched on uh, the continuing legal education part in Section 1, Sub 1. So our, but I didn't, while she touched on it, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Are we saying that um, that prosecuting attorneys and public defenders are going to be able to use this as part of their CLE requirement for the state for the state bar? I know they already do in house CLE is that type of thing. And then the second part of that is: is there any work on possibly expanding it to all attorneys in Nevada? Uh, youth Legislator Melendez, for the record, thank you so much for that question. Uh, when I originally mentioned that in my speech, I was referring to an instance we had at a meeting, a, uh, I would say about a month ago, where I believe it was Senator Weiner, correct me if I'm wrong, who just out of the blue mentioned that that could be a possible way to reduce costs. Um, I'm not sure that that was included in the amended language of the bill. That was simply an idea we had like I said, to reduce costs. Um, yeah, that's that's where the origin of that idea came from in my speech. I wasn't necessarily referring to language in the bill. This is Melanie Scheibel for the record, and I'll just uh, follow up on that and say that um, for all of the people who are included in this bill who have to go through this training, there is nothing in the bill that prevents it from being combined with another type of training that they have to go through. And in fact, um, I think we did hear from some of the agencies that they already do this kind of training. And so um, the purpose is not to require 10 additional hours or you know an additional class, but to make sure that either their curriculum includes it or they develop a curriculum, partner with another organization. Um, personally, I think it would be fantastic to see the Nevada Bar Association do implicit bias trainings for all attorneys and then whether um, you know a public defender's office or an indigent defense office that works with kids wants to send all of their attorneys to that training or whether those attorneys want to go individually um, i think would be fantastic but um, there is nothing prohibiting the training from being used for other purposes as well whether that is a continuing legal education requirement a continuing post requirement a continuing um, ecfs requirement no reason that it couldn't be utilized in both Thank you. Do we have other questions from committee members? Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you. I too want to commend the youth legislators. I was able to participate with them down in the Grant Sawyer building one day, and they're all very impressive um, for being so young. And um, so it's good to see you here. So I just wanted to follow up on the training. So it's it's not, it's from what I heard you say, Senator Scheibel, it's not like a certain amount of hours. It's, you know, you're not saying you have to have 10 hours or three hours. It's just part of, um, it could be part of another training or course. Is that right? This is Melanie Scheibel for the record. And yes, that's correct. You'll see subsection two of section one outlines what the training must include. So it's not an hours requirement, it's um, you know trauma-informed training, um, 
the historical inequities in the juvenile justice system, implicit bias, cultural competency for the LGBTQ community, as well as racial and ethnic minorities. Um, it has to hit all of those um, standards or those subject matters, but that's the only limitation. And are some departments um, already doing this? Did, did you also say that? This is Melanie Scheibel for the record. And yes, that is my understanding. Um, for example, the Clark County District Attorney's Juvenile Justice, or sorry, Juvenile Division already does training that I think they determined would either meet these requirements or would only require a small adjustment to meet the requirements. Assemblywoman Krasner. Thank you, Chair Yeager. Um, I just, I would be remiss if I didn't say what a great job our two youth legislators did on this bill. Obviously very well prepared. Uh, and thank you, Senator Weiner. I know that you have uh, promoted this program uh, tirelessly over the years, and I wanted to thank you. Okay, let me ask just a couple of questions, if I could. So uh, the first question I have is in section one, subsection one of the bill. So I'm looking at lines 14 to 18. And it indicates there that this training is to be completed at least once every two years. But at the beginning on line 14, it says, unless the regulations. So my question was, is the intent here that uh, it's going to, that by regulation, it could be required, the training could be required more frequently than once every two years? So just for the legislative intent, wanted to ask what the thought process was in, in putting that uh, sentence in the bill, please. I'll let our, looks like our youth legislators are not going on this one. So I will, this is Melanie Scheibel for the record. I can answer that very quickly. Yes. Thank you, Chair. I thought that was the answer. And then the other question I have is just a, a little bit out of curiosity. So on that same page, going down to lines 31 and 32, it's talking about some of the information that would be provided in the training. And in subsection two there, it says historical inequities in the juvenile justice and criminal justice systems. And so my question was, I, I understand, I, th I think the bill in its original form was a little bit broader, but this reprint relates to juvenile justice. So I uh, wanted to know uh, what the intent was behind putting the criminal justice system as a whole as a topic rather than limiting it to the juvenile justice system. Looks like you might be up again, Chair Scheibel. All right, Melanie Scheibel for the record. And I think that the two are pretty inextricably linked. It's hard to uh, provide a lot of information about the juvenile justice system without also um, explaining what goes on in the larger criminal justice system. And unfortunately, we also see that a lot of people who start in the juvenile justice system are later involved in the larger criminal justice system. And so I think that um, it is important that anybody who is working with youth who are involved in the uh, justice system also understand that uh, not only are there historical inequities that continue into adulthood, but also a lot of the um, systemic issues that youth face are the same as people in the larger criminal justice system because judges, prosecutors, law enforcement officers, um, legislators, you know, they serve both populations at the same time. And so it's very hard to divorce the two, although they definitely have, there are definitely some special um, issues related to juvenile justice, which would be an important, um, it would be important for the training to define very specifically. Thank you for that response. Certainly understand that. And I, for one, believe uh, more training is always better than less training as uh, we move along in this world. I think with our life experiences and hearing from others, uh, including our youth legislators, about what their experiences have been, I think we can all learn from that. So I certainly appreciate the inclusion of that in the bill. Uh, last call for questions, committee members. Are there additional questions for our presenters before we take testimony? 
Okay, I don't see additional questions. So again, I want to thank you, Chair Scheibel, uh, Senator Weiner, and to our two youth legislators, thank you. This is a great morning for Senate District 9 and therefore uh, Assembly District 9. So it's very nice to have uh, you here presenting. And we'll ask you to sit tight for just a moment. We'll take some testimony on the bill and then we'll have a chance for concluding remarks. So at this time, I'll open it up for testimony in support of Senate Bill 108. And we're going to start here in the room in Carson City. So Chair Scheibel, you'll have to, <laughs> we only have one chair at the table these days. So we'll ask you to vacate and we'll take testimony here in Carson City. Mr. Sheepak, please go ahead. Hello, and uh, thank you, Chair Yeager and committee members for having me today. And it's great to be here in person. I actually still can see my face in the reflection here. Um, I, I want to thank the youth legislators for bringing this extremely important bill and for allowing me to work with them. It has been a pleasure and an honor. They are correct that in Clark County, while black students make up about 14% of the student body, they make up over 43% uh, of arrests and citations. If you are black and a youth in Nevada, you are 3.5 times as likely to be arrested as their white counterpart. This type of training is not going to cure everything. But I know firsthand, I have taken much of this training. While I got my master's degree in social work, we did cultural competency training, implicit bias training. I was putting myself through school by substitute teaching. I myself was able to identify that I noticed and addressed behavior that was disruptive by students who did not look like me quicker than I did for students who did. I myself had implicit bias. It was aggravating, it was upsetting, but when you understand the history of implicit bias, that it is part of our culture, that it is part of how we grew up, it's part of how we watched teachers and other people act, you are able to address it. I was able to better serve my students. I was a substitute teacher, the stakes were low. I saw different kids randomly, periodically. In the juvenile justice system, the stakes are extremely high. Implicit bias can mean the difference between removing a kid from his house or letting him stay with his parents. It can mean uh, detention or not detention. It can mean life or death in some situations. The least we can do is th pass this bill and help people have the same training I had so that they can identify their bias, they can address it, and they can better serve the youth of Nevada. I urge you to pass this piece of this legislation. And again, thank you for having me. And Mr. Sheepak, I don't know if you said your name and who you were with at the beginning, so could you say that for the record, please? Yes, my name is Nick Sheepak, S-H-E-P-A-C-K. I am the Policy and Program Associate with the ACLU of Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheepak. It's good to see you here in person after hearing from you on the phone so often. And uh, we're all dealing with reflections as well. I see all kinds of different reflections in these plexiglass uh, penalty boxes, as we like to call them. So thank you for being here this morning. Anyone else in the room in Carson City? Welcome, Senator Harris, and please proceed. Good morning, Chair Yeager uh, and members of the committee. Forgive me, you will be hearing from me quite a bit today. Um, but as I serve on the board of the uh, youth legislature, I felt I should come forward and let you all know that it is um, one of my um, better forms of, of public service. Uh, and I'm very proud of the youth legislature and, and the work that they've been able to do. Uh, I implore your support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Senator Harris. We were going to call this uh, Senator Harris Friday in Assembly Judiciary. We still may do that by the end of the meeting, so we'll be seeing a lot of you this morning, I'm sure. Uh, anyone else here in Carson City who'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 108? Okay, I don't see any elbowing or jockeying on the way to the table. We don't have anyone on the Zoom, as far as I know, to testify in support. So BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there's anybody there who would like to offer testimony in support of Senate Bill 108? Good morning. Thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 108, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And we will begin with caller with the last three digits of 377. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning. My name is Deshaun Jackson, B-A-S-H-U-N-J-A-C-K-S-O-N. 
I serve as the Director of Children's Safety and Welfare Policy with the Children's Advocacy Alliance. And this morning, we stand in support of Senate Bill 108. We believe that it's important to address implicit bias and cultural competency. Uh, and then in saying that, having those trainings uh, necessary. We thank the Nevada Youth Legislator for bringing this bill forward, and the bill sponsors, and the committee chair. Thank you all so much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Jackson. BPS, could we take the next caller in support, please? Yes, next caller with the last three digits of 882. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary. This is Bridget Duffy, B-R-I-G-I-D-D-U-F-F-Y, Chief of the Juvenile Division for the Clark County District Attorney's Office. I'm here today on behalf of the Nevada District Attorney's Association to support SB 108. I'd like to thank the Nevada Youth Legislature for including me in conversations on the language of SB 108. And before I put my specific support on the record, I'd like to help out with a couple of questions that were asked since I was um, proudly involved in um, the, the language that came out for amendment. Uh, to Assemblywoman Bill Bray, Bray Axelrod's question around regular and routine contact, the intent of that, uh, when we put employees in the juvenile justice system who work with children, we wanted to make sure we excluded support staff so that my legal secretaries at the DA's office or legal secretary working for the director of juvenile justice services uh, who would not have regular or routine contact with a child would not have to be mandated to take this training if that hopefully makes sense to you all. We didn't want it to just be a general employed in the juvenile justice system. Um, because that then goes really broad, and so it has to be somebody who would be actually having um, routine and regular contact with children. As to Chair Yeager's question around inequities um, in the criminal justice system being included with the juvenile justice system, I remind everyone here that we still certify children into the criminal justice system on both certification hearings and direct files, which this committee has heard about earlier this session. And so it goes, it, as uh, Senator Scheibel said, it goes hand in hand that we need to understand that there are historical inequities in both systems because our children do end up in the criminal justice system. So on to my support testimony, I'd like to specifically uh, point out um, how proud I am of the recommendations to add section one, in section one, subsection two, C is in CAT, subsection three the impact of trauma and adverse childhood experiences on decision-making and behaviors of children. I sit as a member of the Juvenile Justice Oversight Committee's Racial and Ethnic Disparity Subcommittee, which is chaired by Rebecca Graham out of Sierra Sage in Northern Nevada. In the summer of 2020, we embarked on a survey of all law enforcement agencies across the state of Nevada to determine what training law enforcement received specific to children. And what we learned was there was already training around implicit bias and cultural competency and, and a general training on juvenile law. But as you can imagine, that general training was just basically how old you, a child is before you can charge them, what an adjudication is versus a, a guilty plea. So it's really just explaining how the juvenile justice system works, but nothing specific to child development or more importantly, how adverse childhood experiences impact children's decision-making and behaviors. My career, I grew up handling children in foster care. I spend probably every day at least talking to one child within the system, being foster care or juvenile justice. So in 20 years, I've, I've come to understand uh, while getting frustrated that the adverse experiences a child has growing up definitely uh, paints how they respond to me. And so this, in my opinion, the youth legislature, including this specific training requirement, SB 108, is going to have a significant impact, a positive impact on our state. I thank them for bringing forth this bill. I really thank them for listening um, when I asked them to put that in, and I support SB 108 in its passage. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Duffy, and thank you for being engaged in the process. I'm sure that was useful for our youth legislators to receive feedback and be able to work on the language. BPS, could we take the next caller in support, please? Next caller with the last three digits of 069. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. 
Hello, my name is Andre Wade, A-N-D-R-E-W-A-D-E, State Director for Silver State Equality, calling in uh, support of SB 108. Um, I do believe in part it will complement AB 99, which was passed in 2017 from an LGBTQ perspective, um, and want to applaud uh, the legislature for um, this bill that they brought forward. Um, if you all remember uh, the last session, um, we um, helped them to pass the uh, gay trans panic defense bill. And so once again, they are really taking on some heavy and much needed um, work that needs to be done with uh, within law enforcement, juvenile justice in particular. So again, uh, full support of SB 108. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Wade. BPS, could we take the next caller, please? Yes, next caller with the last three digits of 080. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, Jim Hoffman, representing Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice. NACJ supports SB 108 because implicit bias is a real problem in the criminal justice system. Of course, it is also a problem in the adult system, as the bill originally addressed. While we still believe this bill should apply to the adult system, the amended version is a step in the right direction, and so we support it. Thank you, and we would like to thank the proponents of the bill for bringing this measure. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Hoffman. BPS, next caller, please. Next caller with the last three digits of 130, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. And I'm a policy director with Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada in support of Senate Bill 108. First, I want to thank the Nevada Youth Legislature for proposing this important legislation and for their inspiring testimony this morning. It is well documented that systemic racism is prevalent throughout the criminal justice system with the over-policing and mass incarceration of community color, communities of color. According to the Vera Institute of Justice, black people are incarcerated in state prisons at a 5.1 times greater than that of white people. They explain that these racial disparities in the criminal justice system are no accident, but rather rooted in the history of oppression and discriminatory decision-making that have deliberately targeted black people and helped create an inaccurate picture of crime that deceptively links them with criminality. SB 108 to require implicit bias and cultural competency training is an important step in rooting out systemic racism from our criminal justice system. We urge your support of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Saunders. BPS, could we take the next caller, please? Next caller with the last three digits of 611, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chairman Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. This is John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office testifying in support of this bill. We'd like to thank the Nevada Youth Legislature for bringing this bill forward. I think implicit bias and racism are two things that need to be rooted out at our system and especially our criminal justice system. In order to stop the school to prison pipeline, the Nevada Youth Legislature is correct that this is something that needs to be addressed. So we thank the uh, youth for leading the way on this and urge your passage of this bill. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Pirro. BPS, take, let's take the next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 318. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. This is Kendra Birchy, K-E-N-D-R-A. B-E-R-T-S-C-H-Y with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. I just want to echo the statements before me as to the importance regarding this bill, the importance of ensuring that our juveniles who are involved in this system trust and believe that the others who are the stakeholders can be held accountable to ensure that they are treated fairly. I'll just note that this starts as simple as when somebody enters into a building, one of the juveniles with just how to interact and to ensure that they are treated fairly and aren't looked at differently. Um, I'll just also note that I was able to already conduct these trainings through other agencies within Nevada. We have a lot of resources um, for the attorneys. This will uh, 
be considered for continuing legal education, which is required. We have already a mandate for ethics. This satisfies um, the ethics credit. So we do believe that this is absolutely possible, cost effective, and more importantly, just needed for our juveniles to ensure that they feel like they have a voice that is heard regardless of who they're speaking to. And so we do believe that it helps to build that trust and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Birchie. BPS, do we have additional callers and support? If you have recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 108, press star nine now to take your place in the queue. For callers who have recently joined the call and would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 108, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And caller with the last three digits of 104, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Maria Teresa Lieberman Farraga. That's M-A-R-I-A hyphen T-E-R-E-S-A-L-I-E-B-E-R-M-A-N-N hyphen P-A-R-R-A-G-A. And I'll keep this short and just say that we, I am here with Battleborn Progress, and I'll keep this short just to say that we uh, support this bill and ditto to everything that was said throughout the testimony and presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. BPS, do we have additional callers in support? Chair, there are no further callers in support at this time. Oh, just one moment. Caller with the last three digits of 653, please please state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes, it may begin. Good morning, Chair Yeager and the awesome esteemed to the uh, Assembly Judiciary Committee. This is Dora Martinez. I'm gonna keep it short because I'm at the gym. Sorry for the background noise. I did all with uh, the prior set and the statement. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Enjoy the donor. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Martinez. And I just want to note, um, I don't know that the legislature has ever been as accessible as it is this session. We just had a caller at the gym call in <laughs> to provide supportive testimony. So um, I wanted to note that for the record, although the building is not completely open yet, uh, we are allowing all kinds of folks to testify this session at the legislature from different locations. And I, for one, think that makes for a better legislative process and better legislation. So thank you, uh, Ms. Martinez, for being able to call in at the gym. Do we have any callers in support, uh, any other callers in support, BPS? Chair, there are no further callers in support at this time. Thank you so much. I'll close testimony in support. I will now open it up for testimony in opposition. We'll start here in the room in Carson City. Is there anybody who would like to testify in opposition? I don't see anyone coming forward. Likewise, I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom with us in opposition. VPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there's anybody there in opposition, please? Thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 108, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. For callers wishing to provide opposition testimony, for Senate Bill 108, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, BPS. I will close opposition testimony. I will now open up for neutral testimony. Anybody with us here in Carson City in the neutral position? I don't see anyone coming forward. We don't have anyone on the Zoom in neutral. BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there's anybody there in neutral? Yes, Chair. For callers wishing to provide testimony in neutral of Senate Bill 108, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And we will begin with caller with the last three digits of 663. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is John McCormick, J-O-H-N-M-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K the Assistant Court Administrator at the Nevada Supreme Court. Uh, I 
am calling in under neutral as uh, I think the, this is now a policy question for the legislature and, and we don't take a position on that. But I do want to express how grateful we were for all the work that was done by our youth legislators and their advisor and all the interested parties in uh, crafting an amendment that alleviated um, the concerns that we raised uh, on the other side. So uh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. McCormick. BPS, do we have other callers in the neutral position? Yes, Chair. Caller with the last three digits of 141, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Yeager and Assembly Judiciary. Catherine Roos, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N-R-O-O-S-E, Deputy Administrator for the Division of Child and Family Services. I want to thank the Youth Legislature for bringing this bill to the legislative session, and I also want to congratulate the representatives of the Youth Legislature on their impressive testimony today. DCFS currently has regulations relating to training for juvenile justice agencies in NAC 62B, and should this bill pass, this update would be feasible without additional resources. Additionally, DCFS also has a pro already has a process in place to review content of mandatory trainings for state and county juvenile justice agencies, and this could be easily added to the process. Um, so we are neutral today, and we look forward to continue, continuing to work uh, with the stakeholders on this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Roos. BPS, additional callers in the neutral position. Yes, thank you, Chair. If you have recently joined the call and would like to testify in neutral of Senate Bill 108, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And Chair, there are no other callers in neutral at this time. Thank you so much, BPS. I'll close neutral testimony. We will now go back to concluding remarks on the bill. So would invite Chair Scheibel back to the table or and allow her to make some concluding remarks and then allow our two youth legislators to make remarks as well. So please go ahead, Chair. Thank you so much, Melanie Scheibel, for the record. And I just want to thank everybody for their time and attention today and for engaging in a conversation on SB 108. I do think it is a good piece of legislation, and I hope that you'll support it. Thank you so much. We'll go next to uh, youth legislator uh, Haley Mescal. Would you like to make any concluding remarks? Thank you, Chair Ye Yeager and members of the committee, Youth Legislator Monique Tehe-Lemesco for the record. I would just like to quickly note that there are six other youth legislators who have submitted power powerful written testimonies to support the passage of Senate Bill 108. And these um, testimonies should have been provided to you and should be available on Nellis as well. Um, and Senate Bill 108 has the ability to significantly change the lives of youth, and these trainings are crucial to address implicit bias. I urge you all to support this bill and take steps forward towards ending systemic racism. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, and Youth Legislator Melendez will give you the last word on the bill. Youth Legislator Melendez, for the record, I just want to thank the committee today for giving us the time to give our testimony. This has been an incredibly enriching experience for myself uh, and Chair Haley Miskell. Thank you so much. And I really urge you to pass this. I echo Chair Haley Miskell's sentiments um, that this bill has the potential and will change the lives of Nevada and youth for the better. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. And I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Chair Scheibel and uh, Senator Harris for your work with the youth legislator. And of course, Senator Weiner, you've been a tireless champion of this program for longer than I can remember. So thank you. You should obviously be very proud of uh, what the program has become. And I didn't want to miss uh, Miss Ashdown as well. She is background support uh, for the youth legislator and has been instrumental in making this all happen. And she's also been pulling double duty for a lot of us with constituent services over the last year and a half. So on behalf of uh, this committee and the legislature as a whole, just want to say thank you all so much for a wonderful presentation this morning. And thanks for spending some time with us here in Assembly Judiciary. We hope you all have a fantastic weekend. And I will now close the hearing on Senate Bill 
108, and we're now going to go to Senator Harris Part 2 of our agenda. We will go to Senate Bill 148 in its first reprint. I will now open the hearing on that bill. Senate Bill 148 establishes provisions regarding the reporting of hate crimes. Welcome back, Senator Harris, and when you're ready, please proceed, and then I'm sure we'll have a few questions for you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Chair Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. Uh, I appreciate you all giving me a little bit of your time today. Uh, I am Dallas Harris, representing Senate District 11 in Clark County. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to present Senate Bill 148 to you all, a bill which seeks to codify and statute the reporting of hate crimes in Nevada and to ensure that the data gathered in relation to those crimes is reported to the Federal Bureau of Investigation for inclusion in its annual report and made publicly available. Before going over the specifics of SB 148, I would like to explain briefly why I believe it is important for us to pass this bill. The most recent data available from the FBI shows that in 2019, hate crimes across the United States rose to their highest level in over a decade. And while black people continue to experience vastly more hate motivated crime than any other sector of the population, bias motivated crimes went up across the board. Hispanic and Jewish populations saw the highest year over year increases, but Asian Americans and transgender people also saw increases in the number of attacks they experienced. In Nevada, we saw an overall increase between 2018 and 2019 of nearly 79% with an increase related to race, ethnicity, or, an, or ancestry of nearly 130%. Perhaps equally alarming is the fact that according to the FBI, out of more than 15,000 law enforcement agencies that voluntarily take part in reporting, in 2019, only 2,172 agencies reported a hate crime. That means 86% of agencies did not report a single hate crime, and this includes law enforcement in 71 cities with populations over 100,000. Clearly, there's a national problem uh, with data collection and reporting. While I'm, happy, uh, while I'm happy to note that we in Nevada are already compiling and tracking this kind of information, our law enforcement agencies are not statutorily required to do so, nor is the Central Repository for Nevada Records of Criminal History statutorily required to provide this information to the FBI or to the public. This is something the legislature should address. Tracking and reporting this kind of data is vital if we are to have any success in stopping these crimes. Likewise, how this information is gathered and disseminated must not be subject to political interference of any kind or to the changing dispositions of agency leadership. For these reasons, uh, Senate Bill 148, the first reprint as you all should have in front of you, addresses data gathering and reporting in two ways. First, it ensures the Nevada law enforcement agencies report hate crimes to the central repository each month. The repository will, in turn, report this information to the FBI. Uh, second, it requires a central repository to make this information publicly available. Uh, thank you, uh, Assemblyman uh, Yeager, Chair Yeager, and uh, committee members for hearing SB 148 today. I hope you'll agree with me that codifying and statute the requirements for data collection and reporting of hate crimes crimes is vitally important if we are to understand and shed further light on this issue in a consistent and meaningful way. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Senator Harris. We do have a couple questions so far. We'll start with Assemblywoman Kasama. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Harris, for the presentation. So my question is, um, so right now, is it more voluntary, the reporting of data to the FBI? And, and right now, you're saying many of the agencies are doing it. So, so, so this is just to get it in statute. So we already have a, a, a good policy of, of, of accumulating this data. Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman uh, Kasama. To you through uh, Chair Yeager, yes, that is correct. We here in Nevada are uh, keeping track of these statistics. Uh, what we do not have is a centralized collection uh, across the state. Uh, we have no mandate that that information be shared uh, with, with the FBI, uh, and also no mandate that it be made publicly available so that Nevadans can um, have some idea of, of what these uh, hate crime statistics are on, a, on an aggregate level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fo follow up, Chair? Please. Um, my other question is, um, in Section 5 here, it talks about the data um, being submitted. 
it, the, the data is strictly the events that have happened. There are no names for the people, right? No names are... Uh, thank you for the question uh, to you again, Assemblywoman, uh, through Chair Yeager. Uh, that is correct. There is no ability for uh, anyone to uh, single out a particular incident and, and um, uh, track it back to an individual uh, person who may have committed one of these crimes. The, the data is to be anonymized and, and aggregated. Great. Thank you. And Senator Harris, no need to go through the chair unless you'd like to do that. You're free to go directly to the member. We'll go next to a question from Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. Um, thank you so much for bringing this very important piece of legislation. My question is, um, when it's made publicly available, is this like a website or do you have to request it like a data request? And if it's a data request, is there a fee associated with that as well? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Um, it is my understanding the central repository will put it on their website. No need to make a uh, separate data request. It'll just be published. Do we have other questions from committee members? Assemblywoman Cohen? I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Senator. I have a question. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer it, and I don't know if we've got um, the central repository on the line or not, so I'll just put it out there, and maybe if you can or someone else can, or I'll, I can contact them later. Um, my question is about the established language about the data in Section 2, Sub 4. So it's not changed language, but um, it's it says that there's not going to be any... Uh, information that will reveal the identity of an individual victim of a crime. And I was thinking more about when organizations are targeted, like synagogues or mosques. I mean, especially there are some areas where I, I think there might just be one mosque. Um, and if you put that, that record out there, it's obviously going to be the mosque. So do you know what do they do with when schools or, or religious organizations, something like that, or, or an LBGQTQ center is, is targeted? Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Cohen. Uh, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Um, it is, um, if the data is available, uh, what you might see is in Clark County, there were X number of hate crimes. Here's the categories that they fell into. Um, I don't believe that, that you have any more difficulty in, in reporting just because uh, the hate crime that was committed was against an entity as opposed to a individual person. So I believe we, we should be able to uh, collect that data without um, uh, obviously uh, putting out uh, who the target might have been. Thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and ask a question, if I could, Senator Harris. In uh, the first section of the bill, subsection one, I'm looking at line five. And so the reporting requirement is re reporting all crimes that manifest evidence of prejudice. And the reporting has to happen by local law enforcement. So my question is, is law enforcement the one who's going to make the determination of whether there's manifest evidence of prejudice? Or is that going to be, you know, in consultation with the district attorney who may charge a hate crime or a hate crime enhancement? If you could shed some light on uh, how that might work on the ground level, I'd appreciate it. Thank you for the question, Chair Yeager. It is my understanding it would be the latter. Uh, we are not changing the definition of what a hate crime is through this legislation, and so uh, the current practice would continue. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions for Senator Harris on Senate Bill 148? Okay, Senator, I don't see additional questions, so ask you to hold tight for just a moment. We'll take some testimony and then come back for concluding remarks. At this time, I'll open it up for testimony in support of Senate Bill 148. Do we have anyone here in Carson City who would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 148? Everybody looks busy on their devices. Nobody is coming to the table. Ms. Brown, welcome. Please go ahead. Uh, Tanya Brown, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. Um, thank you, uh, members. Uh, Chair Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary. We strongly support this bill. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Brown. Appreciate that. Anybody else here in Carson City? Okay, don't see additional testimony in Carson City. I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom, but I'm going to give it just a moment in case I'm wrong about that. If you are on the Zoom and like to testify and support, please just unmute yourself and let me know. I don't hear that happening. So at this time, BPS, could we go to the phone lines and take testimony and support there? Thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 148, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. For callers wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 148, please press star nine now. And Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you, BPS. I'll close testimony in support. I will now open it up for testimony in opposition. Is there anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition? Nobody is coming to the table. I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom either in opposition. BPS, could we check the phone lines to see if there's anybody there in the opposition category? Yes, thank you. For callers wishing to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 148, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. We will begin with caller with the last three digits of 069. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 069, you may begin your testimony. My apologies, Chair, the caller hung up and there are no further callers in opposition at this time. Thank you, BPS. I'll close opposition testimony. I believe the caller that was on was Mr. Wade and I suspect that maybe he was in support of the bill and uh, just didn't dial quick enough. So uh, BPS, could we just go back to support and see if uh, Mr. Wade is there with a 069 ending number would like to offer testimony and support? Yes, Chair. Caller with the last three digits of 069, if you would like to provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 148, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Go ahead, caller. You may provide your testimony. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, this is Andre Wade um, calling in support, A-N-D-R-E-W-A-D-E, -E, uh, Silver State Equality State Director. Um, apologies for the kerfuffle. Um, so in short, uh, in full support of SD 148, um, there was a time a couple of years ago when we were working on um, the Gay Trans Panic Defense Bill and there was conversations about hate crime data being available, but it wasn't readily available. Um, and if you go to uh, some of the FBI websites and all these things, um, trying to find data that's specific to Nevada and that's consistent is hard to find. So having consistent data um, is going to be uh, much needed and very important um, for accountability and um, just knowledge. So again, in support of SB 148. Thank you all. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Wade. Um, I'll now close, reclose supportive testimony. I believe we already closed opposition testimony, so now we'll go to neutral testimony. Is there anybody here in Carson City who'd like to offer neutral testimony? I don't see anyone coming forward. I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom in neutral. BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there's neutral testimony there, please? For callers wishing to provide testimony in neutral of Senate Bill 148, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Callers wishing to provide testimony in neutral of Senate Bill 148, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you, BPS. I will close neutral testimony. Senator Harris, would you like to make concluding remarks on Senate Bill 148 in its first reprint?
I just want to thank you, uh, Dallas Harris, for the record. I just want to thank you again for uh, taking the time to hear this bill. Uh, the testimony was a little bit more robust on the Senate side, so if you all are, are interested, please uh, feel free to, to uh, look back at that hearing. Um, but thank you all so much for your, your questions and your time. Thank you so much, Senator Harris. I'm now going to close the hearing on Senate Bill 148, but please don't go far because we have now reached part three of the Senator Harris trilogy this morning in Assembly Judiciary uh, to be determined whether part three is better than part one or part two. So we'll leave that up to you. At this time, I'm going to open the hearing on Senate Bill 212 and its first reprint. That measure revises provisions relating to the use of force by police officers. Welcome back, Senator Harris, and please proceed when you're ready. All right, good morning uh, again, all. Um, I am Senator Dallas Harris representing District 11. Uh, I did not count, but I believe roughly I have about 50 more bills coming to this committee. Um, so hopefully we'll have, I'll get my own week. That would be uh, fantastic. Uh, I'm here to present SB uh, 212 to you all today. Uh, this bill is a labor of love uh, that I have worked on months with uh, various stakeholders. Uh, and I believe we've come to a, uh, a fantastic place um, over the time. I just want to give a couple of disclosures, and I'll apologize to the committee ahead of time. There are a couple of amendments that did not make it into the uh, first reprint uh, that we had all agreed on as, as stakeholders. And so I'd like to give that uh, caveat at the beginning. You may hear some testimony in opposition based upon the rules of the committee uh, because, because those amendments have not yet made it into the, into the language. Uh, I am committed to uh, making sure that we get this right uh, and following up on the understanding that I've had with all stakeholders. I do not believe those changes uh, change the bill substantively, uh, which is why I agreed to them. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll uh, just move forward with the sections of the bill. Okay, so uh, this bill does a couple of things. It requires that uh, police officers use de-escalation techniques uh, before resorting to some higher level of force. Uh, if they have to resort to that higher level of force, we're going to ask them to identify themselves if it's safe to do so. Uh, they can do that just by having their uniform on, uh, by verbal commands, uh, or, or other reasonable uh, means. We're going to ask them to use a level of force that is objecti objectively reasonable. We can balance that against the level of force or resistance that is being uh, uh, used by uh, the person they are trying to um, uh, either arrest or, or subdue. Uh, and to the extent possible, uh, that force should be carefully controlled. We're going to ask law enforcement agencies to adopt a written policy and provide training on what threat, uh, uh, specifically uh, when it comes to serious bodily harm or death, uh, people who are unarmed and are under 13 or over 70 or physically frail or having a mental uh, breakdown um, or experiencing a medical emergency? Uh, what kind of physical threat do they actually pose? We're gonna, we're gonna ask them to put a policy together on that. Uh, we're also putting together uh, one of my favorite pieces of this bill is a use of force database. Uh, a lot of our uh, police departments are already collecting this data. Uh, I'll turn you to uh, Las Vegas Metro's a report that they did over the last, uh, I think it covers uh, five years, but it breaks down uh, when an officer shoots, uh, what the victim looks like, anytime an officer uh, is hospitalized or, or someone who uh, they are interacting with is hospitalized, uh, and a lot of other extensive data similar to uh, Senate Bill 148. We're going to centralize that data across the state, make it publicly available so that we can all make better uh, public policy decisions based on that. Restraint chairs. Um, I was not aware that we even used uh, restraint chairs anymore. For those who are not familiar, uh, they are uh, chairs similar to 
what we're sitting in, they've got the, the arms and then the straps where you can uh, kind of strap people down uh, in case someone is, is being overly combative or uh, it, you need to bring them under control under certain situations. Uh, originally, I wanted to ban their use completely. Um, this is based upon a request from a young man whose brother died in a restraint chair uh, here, well not here, in Las Vegas. Um, after having many discussions, uh, it doesn't look like we are, are quite able to do that just yet. And so what I've done is spoken uh, with the stakeholders to try and put some reasonable restrictions around their use. Uh, to ensure that, that people who are put in them uh, can be done safely, uh, get them a little bit of medical supervision, uh, make sure that uh, the need for the restraint chair is reassessed uh, regularly, uh, make it very clear that officers should not be using the restraint chair as a threat uh, to people only when it is actually needed. Um, and so uh, we're gonna get those video recorded as well. Uh, and what you see here is almost word for word, standard operating procedure uh, from the Las Vegas Metro uh, Police Department. Lastly, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what officers are allowed to do in response to a protest. I think we can all agree, uh, we shouldn't be indiscriminately uh, shooting kinetic projectiles, which are rubber bullets or, or bean bags, into a crowd. Uh, I've got language in here that says, let's not intentionally target uh, someone's head or neck or spine or, or other vital areas of the body. Uh, if you're going to use uh, chemical agents to disperse, make it an unlawful, uh, call it an unlawful assembly first. Give people a route of egress allow them time to comply, give dispersal orders. Again, this comes from uh, operating procedure from Las Vegas Metro, which was revised after they assessed their actions uh, during the protests of last summer. And so this bill really is trying to put uh, the best practices into law so that we can standardize it across the state. One thing I'd like to note, in this section is uh, it is not clear, although it was my intention, this is one of the amendments that I'll have to make, that officers do not have to go through the rigmarole of doing the three dispersal orders and all of that when there is an imminent threat uh, to person or, or property. Uh, and so I will be submitting an amendment to make that clear uh, and as well as an amendment uh, that was proposed by the city of Reno uh, to kind of work on that use of force language. Uh, but again, I don't believe it, it substantively changes the, uh, uh, the bill. Uh, with that, I will submit myself to any questions that you all have, um, as long as, Chair Yeager, you allow me to uh, invite uh, my colleague, Ms. Walsh, uh, to give a little bit of, of discussion about uh, the use of force and the importance of collecting that data. Thank you so much, Senator Harris. Would you like Ms. Walsh to go now and then take questions? I would. Okay, thank you so much, Senator. Ms. Walsh, please come up to the uh, table here, and when you're ready to present your portion, please go ahead and just please remember to state your name first. All right, for the record, my name is Emily Walsh. Chair Yeager and members of the committee, first I want to thank you for having me here today to present on SB 212 and express my thanks to Senator Harris, the primary sponsor for bringing it forward this session. Um, I'm here to speak to the importance of data collection and compilation in regards to section three of this bill. Um, I first wanna give you some background about myself and why I uh, am able to talk about this, uh, continue with an overview of the current state of the data on this topic as well as the leading sources of this uh, data. I wanted to offer some statistics specifically from Nevada on this topic, and then lastly, offer some closing remarks. Um, I think it is really important to tell you all why I am qualified and familiar to talk about this, um, especially section three of SB 212. I am a recent graduate of two master's degrees programs, a Master of Arts in Politics and Public Administration and a Master of Science in Political Science. Um, the programs that I participated in are heavily focused on research design and quality, 
And within these programs, I specialized in two areas, comparative politics and policy analysis and quantitative methods. Uh, my master's thesis was the culmination of three years of work and was centered on the use of force by police officers in the United States. In order to answer my research question, I had to become very familiar with the data that does and does not exist con uh, concerning the use of force in America. So to start on some general background, it's important to note that there is no federal state-sponsored database um, on the use of force by peace officers in the United States, let alone one that is publicly available. Uh, we have national databases on many other topics, but this is a black hole in the world of data. And as such, the leading data sources concerning use of force uh, and excessive use of force specifically are crowdsourced and compile instances from new sources that are all basically secondhand. I personally have used data from two of these sources, uh, Mapping Police Violence and Fatal Encounters. They are databases that are online available to the public. I also had to argue for their use within my research. Um, I'm going to talk more about mapping police violence, which is considered to be the leading database on this source or on this uh, topic. Uh, their leadership team actually took part in the presentation of this bill on the Senate side, and they, like I said, are regarded as the most uh, complete compilation of people killed by police in the recent past. They uh, are special because they combine entries from three other large impartial crowdsourced databases, Fatal Encounters, like I already said, US Police Shooting Database, and KilledByPolice.net. They also conduct their own investigations in depth to accurately docu document the circumstances around uh, officer-involved deaths, including but not limited to the race of victims, the manner of death, and if the person was armed or not. Uh, this database is also more complete than others on this topic as it includes deaths where people are not shot by police, but they would include uh, the instance of George Floyd's killing where he was uh, killed in an officer-involved death, but he was not killed through a gunshot. Despite these efforts, Mapping Police Violence estimates that their database only covers about 92% of all officer-involved deaths within their time frame. This time frame also only extends back to 2013. Uh, the missing 8% and the shortened time frame are due to law enforcement agencies and officers not being required to disclose deaths that happened while an individual was within custody or was being taken into custody until the passage of the Death in Custody Reporting Act of 2013, which was only signed into law in 2014. Even after this law was passed, though, um, the statistics were not made publicly available. They only had to be recorded, uh, reported to the U.S. Attorney General. Um, additionally, it's really not clear the level of uh, compliance that agencies have uh, had with this legislation, nor the amount of success the legislation has been able to fully capture every instance that should be reported. Um, previous iterations of this legislation, such as the bill passed in 2000 of the same name, resulted in nothing. Uh, states took at least a few years before sending in the data required, and the law expired in 2006 before a single report was released to the public. Because of the lack of official uh, reports and data dissemination, these incomplete databases, despite their best efforts to be comprehensive, are the only source of this information available and accessible to the wider public. Um, now moving kind of on to Nevada specifically, I wanted to take some time to present some st statistics from Mapping Police Violence. Um, this, these statistics were downloaded on February 22nd of this year. They do have a, an updated database as of April, 4, uh, April 18th that I just have not downloaded. I do have the database here specifically filtered and ready to answer any Nevada specific questions I can offer, but I have a few really important statistics that I would like to go over. So um, since January 1st, 2013, the database has 149 documented officer-involved deaths happening within Nevada. Of these, 26 included victims that were black, and 16, uh, of those vic uh, 16 additional victims were not able to have their race determined by the database due to the nature of the secondhand sources. So that means that despite making up only about 8.5% of Nevada's population, according to 2018 census estimates, black people made up over 17% of all victims in police-involved deaths. Uh, a black person was 2.11 uh, times more likely to be killed in an officer-involved incident than a white person. Um, specifically, when we're looking at 
uh, PDs. The Las Vegas Metro was involved in 70 of these deaths, which 14 uh, included black victims. The Henderson PD, North, Le North Las Vegas PD, and Clark County Sheriff are not included within this count, so that doesn't mean that only 70 people were killed within Las Vegas. Uh, similarly, the Reno PD was involved in 16 deaths, three of which included black victims, but the Sparks PD and Washoe County Sheriff numbers are not included. Because the Mapping Police Violence Database believes they've only been able to compile about 92% of incidents, that means that feasibly over 160 officer-involved deaths could have occurred in Nevada since 2013. And again, since this is only since 2013, that doesn't even extend back to the year 2000, which is also recent history. It's important to note that these statistics do not include non-fatal instances of use of force or use of excessive force, meaning that if someone was hospitalized but survived, it, they are not included. Um, these instances specifically are even more difficult for public or crowdsourced efforts to compile because they're not often mentioned in the news at all. Uh, mapping police violence also does not include instances where people have died while being held in custody, in facilities, or while in restraint chairs that are also discussed within this bill. It is really only concerned with the initial uh, interactions between police and uh, civilians. Um, these areas that I just previously mentioned are even larger black holes when it comes to data. There is almost nothing that we have on these topics. Um, like Senator Harris said before, Las Vegas Metro already does compile a lot of these statistics. They're just maybe not made publicly available, and we want to standardize that practice across the entire state. Um, this bill does not create necessarily a new burden on law enforcement agencies or offices. Uh, as well, the standardization of such practices like uh, Las Vegas Metro already has and making those final reports and statistics public can only increase the transparency, accountability, and trust between peace officers and civilians. If these actions were taken, we would also be preparing our agencies for and if the or for if and when the federal government requires the data um, or begins cracking down on states that haven't been complying with the uh, Death and Custody Reporting Act. Um, so basically, in conclusion, I'm just here to bring attention to the need for accurate reporting, compilation, and dissemination of use of force data so that we as a state can make educated decisions in the future concerning the use of force. Much of the conversation around the use of force by peace officers lacks data and thus creates an absence of common understanding, let alone common ground. Statistics like these are beneficial to officers, law enforcement heads, public policy makers like yourselves, and civilians. We should all want to minimize the deaths of Nevadans, and having accurate data is something that can help everyone be aware of the reality of the use of force within our state and move us towards less deaths in the future. As the policymakers in our state, you carry the responsibility to make the best informed decisions possible, not only for the victims of excessive use of force, but also for the wider uh, public and our officers. It's impossible to do so without solid, comprehensive current data. Thank you again for your time today and consideration on this topic. Like I said, I will do my best to answer any specific data questions that you may have concerning Nevada or any questions about the state of data within the wider context. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. And I have a request for you. It's not a question, but uh, you went through a lot of data very quickly, and um, I, I think it's useful data, but I myself am uh, sometimes more of a visual person, so I wanted to ask if um, after the meeting if you'd be able to submit uh, it looked like maybe you were reading off of some testimony or if you would be able to submit some of that in writing to the committee because I think we could post that as an exhibit and that would be helpful to be able to go back and look at as well. Emily Walsh, for the record, of course I can provide that. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate the presentation. So we'll take questions and committee what we'll do is we'll, we'll take those questions then we'll sort of see who's best to answer those and we'll play a little bit of musical chairs, I'm sure. Um, I have a number of questions in the queue already. So here's the order I think I have, and I think, so here's the order I have so far, so everyone knows. We'll start with Vice Chair Wynn, then we have Assemblywoman Gonzalez, Assemblyman Orentlicker, Assemblyman O'Neill, and then perhaps Assemblywoman Cohen. So we'll start with Vice Chair Wynn. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Harris. I know that not only has this been just a, a passion project for you. I know that it is something that you live and you see in your real life and, and we all see in our communities. So 
And I also know that you have a magical way of having everyone at the table and going back and forth. And I think everyone appreciates um, the hard work that you put in to making sure that this language gets where it needs to be and has the best policy that we can put in for our state. So sorry about that little speech there, but I do have a couple of questions. So in section two of your bill, I'm going to be honest with you. I have been reading this section over and over and over again, and I don't understand what, <laughs> what, what is required of it. And I'm just wondering, and I, obviously I, I, I like the intent. Um, I like where you're trying to go with it. I'm just really confused on what it is, like especially in subsection B. So section um, section two, um, one, it's A, it's, first of all, it's, it's necessary for the peace officer to use force, the peace officer must, and then there are the A and B and they're and, so both of those have to be accomplished. And then under subsection B, there's also kind of a definition that's another two parts. And so I'm just confused by that subsection B that says use only the level of force and level of force is the balanced against the level of force or resistance to the extent feasible that is also objectively reasonable. So I'm just wondering kind of what the intent is there, if there's any way to bring some clarity to that because I'm not really sure what balanced and objectively reasonable and the extent feasible I feel like there's too many standards in there. So I was wondering <laughs> what your intent was on that because I just have concerns that if I am having a hard time reading it, I don't know what it would be like, um, you know, and I know you've been working with um, the sheriffs and police officers. So I'm wondering where that language is, what the intent is behind that. Uh, thank you for, for the question, Assemblywoman Wynn. Uh, Chair Yeager, do you mind if I go directly? Please feel free to go directly. All right, thank you so much. Um, so. What, what you see here is a, uh, a collection of, of input. Um, the way that I read this is we start at the top. It has to be objectively reasonable under the circumstance, and that is a, a, a standard uh, that police officers are, are well acquainted with when it comes to use of force. Uh, beneath that, under one and two, is a little bit, in, in my estimation, a little bit more understanding of what that might mean, right? It has to also be balanced. Uh, against the level of force or resistance exhibited by the person uh, and be carefully controlled. Now you asked a question about the extent feasible piece. Uh, that was a request uh, from some of my law enforcement partners on this bill uh, so that I don't require them to be carefully controlled when the situation uh, does not necessarily allow for, for that. And so uh, I wanted to ensure that officers can still uh, feel free to act in a manner uh, that they need to save the, their lives uh, and not be uh, prosecuted at the end because they weren't carefully controlled as they were, uh, you know, in a, in a life or death situation. Chair, may I follow up? I, I, I just have some concerns because um, there, I, I understand, I, I definitely understand the intent that you are looking to accomplish here with the language. I just, I'm concerned that there's objectively reasonable, obviously, you know, I understand that you're trying to incorporate the extent feasible, but it's also balanced. And then, um, um, there's other reasonable means. There's like multiple levels of things. So I'm hoping that um, we might be, and I'd be happy to like sit down and see if we can work on some clarifying language that kind of accomplishes that intent. Um, the second thing that I have is, and I think I have this answered because I did reach out to uh, Mr. Calloway with um, Metropolitan Police Department, but in section four under the restraint chair section, I had looked at section D, which was like a member of the medical staff conducts a medical evaluation of the person immediately before and immediately after. And so I was wondering if you were familiar with like how, how that takes place. Obviously, if someone's going into a restraint chair, I think there are like very unique, specialized, specific circumstances. Do you know what type of medical evaluation takes place before and obviously I understand the intent of why you would want to do it before but I was wondering what that looks like. 
Uh, thank you for the question, Vice Chair Wynn. I actually have not seen a medical staff uh, do an evaluation pre-restraint uh, chair myself, uh, but it is my understanding this is current practice. Uh, and so uh, the uh, corrections officers, law enforcement agencies, um, especially uh, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department are already uh, uh, working uh, in this manner where they want to get someone assessed to make sure that, that the restraint chair isn't going to be uh, too strenuous for that, that particular person. And if I can, I'll, let me just quickly uh, go back to section two. Um, I read that, uh, and I, I, I don't anticipate this will address all of your concerns, but I, I read that to be a, a three-step requirement. It needs to be objectively reasonable. It also needs to be balanced against the force and carefully controlled. Now that's very clear. <laughs> so maybe we could incorporate that. Chair, uh, can you indulge me just for a couple more questions? Um, I, you, you kind of addressed it in your presentation um, about potential amendments that were coming down, but also in section four, um, section seven, regarding the po protest demonstration, there's like a, under the section three, it says if there's an immediate threat of physical harm or death to a person uh, or of the immediate harm to property, then only one order to disperse must be provided. Um, is that the section that you were hoping to kind of clarify? Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Wynn. It is. Um, if there is an immediate uh, threat of, of physical harm or, or um, an immediate harm to property, we had worked out some language where uh, no dispersal order would, would be required to allow officers to act immediately uh, to protect uh, people and property. And then it just is that just the policy that's already existing about protecting uh, property or um, in those circumstances where you don't have to have the um, dispersal order and, you know, the time obviously to disperse? Uh, thank you for the question. If I understand it correctly, are you asking whether this is already in law? No, I'm just asking if there was... Um, If there was like a, um, hmm, how am I going to point this? I'm like thinking out loud now. Um, I, I, I guess was the intent to also include physical harm and death of a person as well as like harm to property and treat those like similarly? Uh, thank you for the question, Vice Chair Wynn. I do not uh, intend to treat them similarly. Um, I believe I worked on some language uh, with with my colleague Holly Wellborn here from the ACLU, uh, that would make the threat to property just be a little bit more uh, of, a, of a higher standard. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want there to be um, this idea that uh, there are folks who are crossing a bridge or who might be blocking traffic, and that would be sufficient to uh, not require an order to disperse uh, before some of these actions happen. Uh, so the standard for, for person is, is, is intended to be a little bit uh, uh, stronger than the standard for, for property. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Chair Wynn. We're going to go next to Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Chair. Assemblywoman Gonzalez, District 16 for the record. Um, Senator Harris, thank you so much for bringing this important piece of legislation. I have a few questions. Um, I just wanted to clarify, did you say that you wanted to use Metro's policy for the armed restraint chairs? Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Uh, the language is modeled after Mo okay. their and policy. Thank you. And is that where someone died recently? Thank you for the question. It is. Uh, however, the policy was updated after that death. Uh, and what you're looking at is the uh, modeled after that updated version of the policy. And then do you know if the community was able to weigh in on cr the creation of that policy? Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. I do not know whether <laughs> uh, the community was at the table as that policy was developed, but I sure as heck brought them to the table as I developed this bill. Thank you so much. And then I had another question um, in regards to um, the um, notif sorry, the three orders to disperse. Um, so <laughs> as many of you all know, I was heavily involved in the protests over the summer. And, um, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to hear if police are dispersing. Sometimes 
you are dispersing or you're running away because they are either, you know, shooting at you or with tear gas, right? So I'm just curious, how do we um, know that orders were dispersed? And how do we know that when you are in a large group, say like downtown, right? And there's like hundreds of people that you know that, that these orders were given and that you are trying to follow these orders. Because it can be very difficult, as I'm sure you're aware. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. And I will point you uh, to uh, uh, line, 40, line 43 on, uh, let's see, page 7. Uh, and, and, and that language is in there for, for that explicit reason. So uh, it must be given in a, matter, a manner that each order may be heard by those persons. Uh, and then we put some, some ideas into place there, including uh, giving that for multiple locations. Uh, and at times, possibly in multiple languages, depending upon uh, the crowd. So the intent here is for uh, officers to, in to do their best to ensure that everyone in the crowd has had a chance uh, to hear uh, prior to uh, taking uh, action. Thank you so much. One more follow-up. Sorry. Um, so are they being, like, trained on this? Is are we just, like, saying, like, how do we... Um, you know, just from experience, it's very difficult, right? So I just, you know, even myself, I could, uh, there were multiple times where where orders were given, but you, you didn't hear them. So, um, or officers are, are, you know, they're in one way and folks are going another way, right? So how do we, you know, decide if they say, hey, well, we said it three times, right? So now we have authority to, you know, use X, Y, and Z. Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Gonzalez. I think you're hitting on... Um, an important point, right? We sit here in the legislature uh, and we can only uh, do so much, right? Like put things into law. The follow-up uh, is often left to uh, those who we direct to do things. Um, you know, I, I am confident that uh, law enforcement agencies are regularly training their officers on what the state of the law is. And so um, as, the, as the law changes, uh, it's my hope that the, the training would also evolve. Um, but we also have to give them a little bit of time to, to catch up to the law. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see how, how it works in practice. And if there is a heavier hand that is needed, uh, we'll continue to reassess. Thank you so much, Senator. Again, I really appreciate you bringing this important piece of legislation. Thank you. We'll go next to Assemblyman Orrin Licker. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Harris, for your important work today with this and the other bill. I'm looking forward to seeing more of you. Um, my question is, one of the things we've seen with some of these excessive force cases is the failure of fellow police officers to intervene. And so I know other states have put in duties. Is that something you thought about, including a duty of colleagues to intervene? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Assemblyman, and it's good to see you as well. Uh, thanks to your chair uh, from the 32nd special session that is already uh, in the law. We have a duty to intervene here in Nevada. Thank you for the shout out, Senator Harris. Appreciate that. <laughs> we have additional questions still. We're going to go next to Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. Senator Harris, believe it or not, after 40 years in law enforcement, I can agree with a lot of your uh, intent of your bill. But it also means I have several questions. And I must admit, some of them have already been brought out. I do think you have some very vague descriptions in here that need to be clarified. And I guess the first one I'd like to ask you about is the definition of use of force that you want reported. And let me just give you a couple examples, if I may. I know there are agencies that if an officer pulls his weapon, period, he must make out a use of force. That means if he's in a burglar, in a in progress burglary going into a building, un, not knowing if a subject is in there or not and pulls his weapon, he must make a use of force report. So that, that would be my first question on your section three on reports that must be made. What's your definition of use of force? Does, in addition, does it include all use of force? Just substantiated use of force? Because I'll be honest with you, I had a complaint made against me when a person was trying to put a gun to my head and I was using his girlfriend who also had assaulted me 
as a weapon. She complained that I, I used an arm bar and was trying to push him off me with her. She complained that the arm bar was too tight and that I hurt her while I was trying to get my head blown off. It was unsubstantiated. So I'm asking you, describe that use of force and what kinds of use of force, to what level are you asking for? I feel that it's an unnecessary report being made and skews the data, which I then also have a question for Ms. Walsh on. Please. Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblyman O'Neill. Um, what we're doing is tying this to the National Use of Force data collection already being done uh, by, by the FBI. And so I'm asking uh, uh, police departments to collect the data uh, that's already uh, outlined in the, the okay. FBI's uh, data collection. That, uh, I'll also... I just That's what I wanted to hear, that we are using that standard and we are not subjecting to, like I was saying, some of these lower or more strenuous standards that are in place by some agencies. So oh. I appreciate that very, very much. And Chair, if I may, can I ask Ms. Walsh to come up? I just have a question on data. Okay, and Assemblyman O'Neill, before, before Ms. Ms. Walsh steps up, I just, I just want to also let you know that uh, this data will also be aggregate and anonymized, and so there will no, be no ability uh, for a, a random person to look up uh, Assemblyman O'Neill uh, and the one time that uh, Officer O'Neill may have used force uh, and how often he particularly uses force against women versus men or, or anything like that. This will just be aggregate data that we can uh, hopefully use to make better policy. May I just say this, if I may, in 40 years I had several use of force reports, none of them were substantiated. Uh, and some of them were quite serious to an extent on harm done to me in protection of my life and others. I just had to throw that in. And, and so. I think that's an important point. Um, this is not a bill that is designed to target individual officers uh, or, or uh, uh, turn them into uh, bad guys as, the, as they try and do their job. We just want to get the data so we know what's going on. And that, that's the part that I agree with you on in the intent. I understand that, and I want to thank you for that part, too, because I think it does help in the long run. So, and Ms. Hey, Walsh. Ms. Walsh, you're up. And Assemblyman O'Neill, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Walsh, in your data that you were reporting on use of force when you did mapping, did you ever overlay any of that use of force by law enforcement on areas that had high UCR Part 1 crimes, the violent crimes, and uh, did any of them coincide together, or was there usually a use of forces in high crime areas instead of other areas that have <clears throat> low crime rates? Sure. Thank you for the question through the chair to you, Assemblyman. Um, I specifically did not work with this data, but I know that the data source mapping police violence has found that the level of crime, specifically violent crime, does not in any way correlate to the use of force used in those areas. Um, I can provide you those statistics um, afterwards, um, but I know on their main website they provide their, their hot item statistics, and that is one of them. There is no correlation there. That's interesting. I pre I'd like to see that, or actually... If delivered to the uh, committee, please. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the time. Thank you, Assemblyman. We're going to go next to Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Chair Yeager. Thank you, Senator Harris, Ms. Walsh, and all those who have worked so hard to bring this presentation. You said something earlier, uh, Senator Harris, that I think um, might... Um, deserve some expansion and that is the state of the law is is a statement that you made um, the current state of the law is that when it comes to protest and demonstration we still have a right to peacefully assemble is that correct uh, yes that is correct uh, I am uh, uh, hoping to codify that uh, and that's what you see in, in the section about protest. I, I think uh, we need to make it very clear we live in America uh, where each person has the right to protest uh, without fear uh, of, of being harmed uh, by police officers. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, I think a lot of us um, 
get caught up and we kind of forget sometimes, no matter what the topic is, um, that we have a right to peacefully assemble and to protest and bring our ills to the public. And um, what we, I think, what you're trying to do is just make sure that there's understanding on both sides on how people assemble and how, when it's time to disperse, that is done in a civil and respectful manner. So um, I appreciate all the questions. I think that people have addressed a lot of the concerns and questions that I had. Thank you for the data and thank you for, you know, uh, not being subjective, but really uh, bringing uh, quantitative data. I think that we really need to have that in order to move forward. And um, I just appreciate your, your time and effort on this. Thank you. Assemblywoman Kasama. Thank you, Chair, Assemblywoman Kasama, District 2, for the record. And thank you, Senator um, Harris. So my question has to do with page 8. I guess that would be section, let me back up here, section 4, uh, 7, one, so that it has to do with the, the protests again. The only, the, the, the section that I have concern with is where we have, except as otherwise provided in this paragraph, at least three orders, and you said you're going to adjust that in, in the um, proposed amendment coming up, that if, if possible, or if it's imminent, it doesn't have to be three orders to disperse, given in a manner that each order may be heard by those persons, including without limitation, issuing the order from multiple locations and issuing the order in multiple languages. My concern there is if it's a peaceful protest and now it escalates into a non-peaceful protest and if the law enforcement do not have with them somebody that speaks that language, it seems to me what we have to have in here is if possible. If possible, issuing the order in multiple languages because if it becomes a non-peaceful protest and there's nobody there to issue the language according to this statute you know the law enforcement will be held accountable and maybe they have to um, respond quickly because it's becoming unpeaceful and now um, there's a requirement that it is said in a language and so I, I think we need in there if possible and and I would imagine that depending on the circumstance many times they'll have an officer that has that language but I think I think it shouldn't be a requirement. It should be if possible. Um, I'm not sure if that was a question, but thank you for your comment. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would turn you then to uh, that last part that we've had a little bit of discussion about, there being an immediate threat of physical harm or death or some immediate uh, uh, imminent harm to, to property. Uh, maybe we're into that category. Uh, mm -hmm. at that point, and then none of those requirements uh, after I make the amendment w would apply. Um, I'd also like to see uh, um, police departments ensuring that if they are uh, going to do a protest in a certain community where they know that uh, people speak a, a different language, that they bring someone with them uh, to police in, in, in that area so that if something like this happens, they are, they are prepared. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I think there's a, a couple of different ways uh, to address that, and it is my intention to allow officers to act immediately uh, when it is necessary to do so. I guess that's what I wanted to make sure, and probably um, it'll come in the amendment, so thank you. Okay, we probably have time for maybe another question before we get to testimony. So let me see if there is another question from the committee. I don't see additional questions. So Senator Harris. Yes, Chair Yeager, if you, if you don't mind, I'd just like to provide a, a little bit more uh, additional information uh, to the committee about how uh, the, the use of force database would work. Um, what we would do is work, I'm working with a central repository on updating their system that would allow police departments to just directly interface uh, with that system. Each department would not be required to set up its own uh, reporting mechanism. Uh, it is my understanding after discussions with the central repository that all police departments in Nevada already interface with them 
for the UCR, the Uniform Crime Reporting. Uh, they can do that in two ways. If they're already kind of technologically set up, it's an uh, automatic thing. Uh, if they are not already kind of technologically plugged in, then there is a, a, a login that all police departments can use and they can enter that data manually. And so those mechanisms would remain in place and would be expanded uh, to allow this, this uniform uh, uh, data collection of use of force. Thank you, Senator Harris. Um, I'll ask you to hold tight for just a moment. We'll take some testimony and then have a chance for concluding remarks. So at this time, I'm going to open it up for testimony in support of Senate Bill 212. We will start in the room here in Carson City. Ms. Brown, welcome, and please go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Yeager. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Senator Harris for bringing this legislation forward. Um, she has talked about proposed amendments. In Section 3... And could you just state your name oh, for the record, sorry. please? sorry. Tanya Brown, Advocates for the Inmates and the Innocent. Um, in Section 3, uh, subsection 1, um, I don't think it goes far enough. Um, it says here on or before July 1st each year, and so if you skip down to 9, it says force that will occurred during the previous calendar years. I'd like to see that change to say during the previous calendar years beginning from 1970 forward. And the reason I say that is because um, there are still law enforcement officers, um, still officers. They've become district attorneys, judges, so on and so forth. Um, back in the um, uh, I just want to bring up a brief case going back about 20 years ago. I may have it state incorrectly. I believe it's the Pavia case. It dealt with a Reno detective um, in a lawsuit in which um, uh, it was filed in federal court. Judge, the Honorable Judge Edward Reed was assigned to the case and heard it. It turns out that there was a situation where Mr. Pavia, I guess, was having an uh, in, uh, incident with his neighbors. They called the police. The police showed up. He answered the door. He didn't want to talk to them. He shut the door. They opened, fought, the officers opened fire, killing Mr. Pavia. And the detective assigned to the case um, ordered the person in the evidence room to destroy the evidence door that showed that the bullet holes showed that it basically they were fired from the outside. Mr. Pavia did not have a gun, did not pose a threat to him. He just didn't want to talk to them. Ultimately, the family settled. That detective then retired from the Reno PD. He now works for the Washoe County. And he's been an officer since, I believe, the 70s. We have, that's why I'm thinking we need to look there. And we also need to look at civil litigation. Ms. Go Brown, I yes. will let you know you're close to your two minutes. Okay. And we'll just ask you to okay, keep just, your remarks to the bill as okay. presented. I think you're going a little bit beyond what but I'd, I'd was like presented. to see something like this or something. And then maybe look into civil litigations because that to get a complete data base on it, you really should look at that because it will show officers involved going over decades. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. We'll stick with testimony here in Carson City. I see Ms. Wellborn is approaching the table. Welcome, Ms. Wellborn, and please proceed. Good morning, Chair Yeager, members of the committee. My name is Holly Wellborn, Policy Director for the ACLU of Nevada. It's wonderful to see you all in my favorite committee. Um, we're testifying in strong support of SB 212. Um, this has been quite a process on this bill, quite a, tra a traumatizing pro process to be quite frank. And every time we come in and we, we talk about this, we've been meeting on Fridays with a large group of stakeholders. Um, and, you know, we're right. It, do it doesn't go far enough. It never does from our perspective. But here we are and we're doing the best we can. We have a good bill before you that does some things and I want to explain that to you. Uh, um, and I'll focus on the protest section. I know that we have a limited amount of time. Um, the protest section, what is it is meant to achieve is it is meant to codify a constitutional disbursement of a protest. This is the minimum standard that has to be met and then it's meant to elevate that beyond the constitutional floor of dispersing that protest. So first it is the issue of gas. So how does law enforcement disperse a protest? They start using gas, they start using kinetic energy projectiles. How do we scale that back to keep people from being harmed, including people like me who go out in my legal observer vest at a protest, I ended up shot in the gut and in the back and in the emergency room. How do we prevent that from happening? So there is the constitutional floor of the disbursement of the protests. Before law enforcement officers can, can disperse gas to clear out an area, to get people to move after they have declared that this is 
um, an unlawful assembly, how do we clear out that in a safe manner that allows for people to disperse orderly? Then the bill further in addressing the kinetic energy projectiles, we want to scale back the use of those. Those are dangerous weapons. They're often called non-lethal weapons when really they can harm people. They put me in the emergency room. Let's think through that for a moment. So we shouldn't be using those weapons at all for disbursement purposes. Those should be used only when a law enforcement officer's life is in danger. I want to thank Rick McCann from the Nevada Police Officers Union for working on language that um, captured another element of this bill. Just because an unlawful assembly has been declared does not mean that we should, ish we should shoot kinetic energy projectiles at people who are remaining in an area, frankly, unlawfully at that point. It's been dispersed, but if you're not engaged in an activity that is going to harm an, um, a, a peace officer or anyone in the vicinity, you cannot use those projectiles on that individual. You have to give them the opportunity to disperse. You have to focus on truly violent behavior in that area. So that is what those sections are meant to achieve. We've worked very hard on them. I'm happy to have conversations with all of you about um, what has happened leading up to um, the bill that is before you today. And if you have any questions for me, please feel free to call and shoot me an email. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Wellborn. Uh, appreciate your testimony and appreciate you sharing your personal experience as well. Um, are there any additional testifiers in support here in Carson City? I don't see anyone coming forward. I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom. Uh, BPS, could we go to the phone lines to take supportive testimony there, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 212, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And we will begin with caller with the last three digits of 556. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Ian Marie Grant, A-N-N-E-M-A-R-I-E-G-R-A-N-T. I support SB 212 moving forward because there is there has to be some type of guidelines in place if we aren't prohibiting the use of restraint chairs in their entirety. It was disheartening to see the original language prohibiting the use of restraint chairs in its entirety removed. Though I understand the pressure to the senator from pol police policy, police policy, police and lobbyists, police lobbyists. As someone whose brother was asphyxiated to death in another tortured device at the Washoe County Jail, I understand the consequences of using this, these type of devices on community members in crisis. The hobble was used to hogtie my brother, which every single page of the manual states and never used to hogtie a human being. Prohibiting the use of restraint chairs would have been vital in preserving the sanctity of life. Countless people have died in the restraint chair at jails and prisons, these tortured devices, as I believe them to be have claimed numerous loved ones. Nicholas Farah was recently asphyxiated at the Clark County Detention Center. He died within two minutes of deputies putting him in the chair. If the language mirrors LVMPD policy, I'll remind you Nick died under those policies. Checks every 15 minutes are too long. Nick was killed in less than a minute. Respiratory issues aren't going to wait 15 minutes if they're going to occur. Brain damage begins within 15 minutes. What is law enforcement's definition of evaluate? A visual look at the person isn't sufficient. A verbal conversation should be had when the person is in the torture device. Constant supervision should be the requirement. Why is it too much to, to demand law enforcement fulfill their Eighth Amendment constitutional obligations to community members? It's care in custody, not kill in custody. I ask, what is law enforcement's definition of violent or life-threatening? That language is vague. I do have to support the bill moving forward, though, as, again, something is better than nothing. I can't speak to Clark County, but if someone dies in Washoe, like my brother asphyxiated, there will be no investigation. Uh, honestly, until Graham B. Connor and Kenneth E. V. Garner, the whole objectionable, reasonable thing are overturned. And DAs prosecute police who use excessive force, murder, or kill due to negligence. This is just like putting a Band-Aid on it. They are, these are used to diffuse demand for prosecuting police brutality and minimize punishment for guilty cops. What families really want is true change. But I do appreciate Senator Harris and her original intentions with the bill. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Grant. BPS, could we take the next caller, please? Yes, next caller with the last three digits of 611. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chairman Yeager and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. This is John Puro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. I'd like to speak in support of Senator Harris's bill. We'd like to thank the Senator for bringing this bill forward and trying her best to work with all stakeholders to make this a good bill. Uh, change is definitely needed, and this is a small measure towards change. It doesn't go as far as it could be, but we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. This is a good step, and we should continue taking steps forward to work on issues between policing and our communities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Pirro. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 080, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, Jim Hoffman representing Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice. NACJ supports SB 212. We believe these are simple common sense steps that the legislature can take to align use of force standards with what is actually necessary and helpful for the safety of the community. While we can and should do more, this is a good first step, and so NACJ would like to thank Senator Harris for bringing this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Hoffman. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 846. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. My name is Eric Farah. Uh, last name Farah, F-A-R-A-H, brother of Nicholas Farah, who was killed by Las Vegas Metro Police in the restraint terror two years ago. While he was not an immediate threat to himself or others, he was immediately put into the restraint chair when arriving at Clark County Detention Center. In under two minutes, four officers killed him by not allowing him to breathe, all while several officers and medical personnel were watching and within six feet of him. He died by positional asphyxiation, just like George Floyd. This is not uncommon. I have talked to numerous other inmates who have lost consciousness while also in the chair and have come, also come very close to dying as well. Clark County Detention Center uses this as a daily as a weapon on a daily basis. This is a huge reason many other cities have already completely banned the chair. They have also killed multiple people. Not only is this a huge liability for the state and city, but never again should families ever have to go through the additional cause the deaths caused by the restraint chair in Nevada. No action or discipline was ever taken by Las Vegas Metro Police Department or Clark County Detention Center for killing my brother. They also work there and threatened the inmates that they'll kill you in the restraint chair like they did to my brother. For the record, no one has ever reached out from CCDC to our family to help update the policy. Although this bill is not is not enough, it is a great start. I appreciate Senator Harris for including us I ask on behalf of my family and my brothers, two youngest daughters, I apologize, who will never see their father again to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Farah. BPS, could we take the next caller, please? Next caller with the last three digits of 196, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chairman Yeager, members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. I'm Eric Spratley, S-P-R-A-T-L-E-Y, the Executive Director of Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. And I've done this for a few years, but I've just gone back and forth. I'm, I've signed in support, but pursuant to committee rules, there were some things in the bill that needed to be changed. But I'm here in support because we've actually worked very hard on this uh, amended version and, and the uh, meant to come. And we appreciate Senator Harris working with all the stakeholders in such a thoughtful and considerate manner. And it's because of this cooperative deliberation and the resulting amended bill before you and then the cleanup to come that we are able to arrive in a supportive position. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Spratley. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 130, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. 
Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. And I'm the Policy Director with Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada here in support of Senate Bill 212. 2020 was a year of reckoning like none before, where hundreds of thousands of people across the nation took to the streets to demand actions to systemic racism after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And despite the jury's guilty verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial this week, there is a long way to go for justice for all people who have been brutalized or killed by the police or those who live in constant fear they could be next. The murder of Nevadans like Jorge Gomez and Micaiah Lee illustrates this. Before us, we have an opportunity to make a meaningful step forward in police accountability. We urge your support of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Saunders. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 318, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Yeager and members of the committee. This is Kendra Bergey. B-E-R-T-S-C-H-Y with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. We appreciate Senator Harris for spearheading this crucial bill. These are important first steps to start to ensure accountability, transparency, and rebuilding trust in our police, in our police agencies. This bill builds upon the important measures that this body passed during the special session and promised community members that we would continue to work on. This bill is a result of a lot of discussion and heavy negotiations. Although not perfect, we do support this bill. It is not a complete overhaul of the system that is needed, but provides much needed change. Justice is a journey, not an end. And we are just starting on that journey and urge your support to ensure justice and rebuilding public trust in our police agencies. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Birchie. BPS, could we take the next caller, please? Caller with the last three digits of 874. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Chairman Yeager and members of the committee for the record, Callie Wilsey, C-A-L-L-I-W-I-L, -L -L -I -I -L, S as in Sam, E-Y, on behalf of the city of Reno. We are in support today with the cleanup amendment the bill sponsor referenced in her presentation earlier. We want to thank Senator Harris for inviting us to the working group on this legislation and ensuring a collaborative effort to arrive at the proposal in front of you today. We appreciate and encourage the questions and conversation this committee had today to ensure the language in the bill is clear and straightforward. The City of Reno and the Reno Police Department remain committed to engaging with our community and members of the legislative body surrounding these important issues. We thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Wilsey. Um, next caller, please. Next caller with the last three digits of 555. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 555. Please press star six to unmute yourself and begin your testimony. Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Tina Cree, a military war veteran. I want to thank Senator Harris for bringing this bill forward and everyone on the call this morning. This bill is, cru this is, bill this bill is a crucial first step for change, especially those that are supporting this bill. My uncle Byron Will Williams was killed in Las Vegas, Nevada on September 5th of 2019. He was riding his bicycle to the gas station. His death was ruled a homicide and, sorry, this is hard. His death was ruled a homicide and my family has not gotten justice. This bill is a crucial first step and we need change. Although it's not perfect, we are in support. And I want to thank everyone that is also in support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Acree. BPS, could we take the next caller in support, please? Caller with the last three digits of 653. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Greetings. Good morning, um, Assemblymen. 
Yeager, uh, Chairman Yeager and Vice Chair. Um, this is Dora Martinez, D-O-R-A-M-A-R-T-I-N-E-Z. I'm, co- I'm, I'm at home now, so it's quiet. I am able to spell my name. I represent the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition, and we are in support of this bill. Thank you, Senator Harris. Um, I don't know. I'm sure you all seen the video last week regarding the um, woman who was deaf. Um, we just want to um, include... Um, people with disability um, be mindful of their needs and their, you know the appropriate practice with the uh, policy that you will be putting forward to, with this bill. Um, thank you so much, and I will be remiss if I don't say because of your awesome uh, District 29 Assemblywoman Cohen. I am so active today because of the website Nellis is really accessible. So thank you, and have a great weekend. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Martinez. We hope you had a good workout. <laughs> we'll go to our next caller in support, please. Chair, there are no further callers in support at this time. Thank you so much, BPS. I will close testimony in support. I'm now going to open it up for testimony in opposition. We'll start here in the room in Carson City. I believe I have Mr. Gramis with us. Welcome, and please proceed when you're ready. Thank you very much, Chair Yeager. Uh, for the record, my name is Steve Gramis. I'm the president of the Las Vegas Police Protective Association. I'm also a commissioned police officer of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, I want to thank you, you Chair, uh, to the committee, and actually want to thank uh, uh, Senator Harris for uh, having some conversation before this hearing uh, with me. Uh, I was under the impression I would have a little bit more time, so I'm going to try and speed up uh, some of the things. Uh, while I'm not in support of the bill, I am in support of the theory of the bill as, as I believe it is. Um, so, um, in 2011, uh, LVMPD invited the DOJ and the COPS personnel to collaborate with them in an attempt to achieve best practice model for use of force. Through this collaboration, LVMPD undertook massive reform to its use of force, de-escalation, handling of the mentally ill policy as well. They did so under the Sheriff Doug Gillespie at the time. The national push at the time was for the DOJ to look into problem police departments and place them under consent decrees for force change. LVMPD reached out on their own to the DOJ and said, we want to voluntarily do better. We want to work with the DOJ on how to make a best practice policy for use of force. This was under President Barack Obama's administration. After a nine-month assessment of the changes made, Metro did, in fact, become the gold standard in police reform. This reform was included uh, with Graham v. Connor, a case that has, held, has been upheld under heavy scrutiny in many cases. To this day, they continue to strive for excellence in policing through community partnerships, engagements with lawmakers and stakeholders as we seek out input from concerned groups like the ACLU, the Latin Chamber, LGBTQ community, and NAACP to name a few. Law enforcement in this state has some of the finest leaders in law enforcement, I believe, in the country. Leaders like Chief Andrus with the Henderson PD, Chief Pamela Ojeda with North Las Vegas, Sheriff Lombardo, Chief Molina of City of Las Vegas, Chief Roper of Washoe County, and Chief Soto of Reno to name a few. All of them are committed to excellence in the field of law enforcement. To me, they all qualify as our state experts for policing. These chiefs and sheriffs are either elected by the people or appointed by city councils who are also elected by the people. Both chiefs and sheriffs continually preach community first in their respective departments. These leaders deserve the ability to collectively come up with the newest and most progressive policies for policing and then report those to the Nevada Post Commission. This group is also extremely diverse, probably one of the most diverse we've seen in leadership in this state, representing members of the Latin community, the female community, and the African American community. I believe our state government owes it to these professionals to allow them to prove that they can make all the necessary changes to policy without enacting specific verbiage in law. If standardization of police policy on use of force is the goal, then this bill is easily simplified in my opinion. Uh, while I'm not very well versed at proposing amendments, as it's been made clear to me this morning from conversations with folks, and many of you know that I'm very new to this, and usually there's someone else sitting in my place up here, uh, what I would love to see is that Nevada Post require all police departments in the state of Nevada to have a standardized use of force policy. This policy would be collectively discussed by the leaders of the major law enforcement agencies from the state. The departments will report their newest policy to Nevada Post, before the 82nd special ses- or session of the legislature. Nevada Post would present the standardized use of force policy to the legislative body at that legislative time. 
As time goes by and new methodology for policing comes forward, these leaders and professionals in the field of law enforcement will continue to get together to update and report the new practices to the Nevada Post Commission. This would include the language related to Section 1 and 2 related to de-escalation and use of force on certain subjects. There's no better example of a use of force policy today than LVMPD. I would assume we all, after reading our policy, can agree with that statement. One of our very own assemblymen, Tom Roberts, was even part of the process to changing this policy back when he was on our department. I would hold our policy up against any in the United States. If this bill is about best practice, we have the model. Senator Harris has worked with LVMPD and has instituted almost every aspect of this bill to match our policy, as she has made mention today. But I would ask that we leave policy for police departments to the experts which I have mentioned. Those leaders deserve the respect as professionals to be able to get this right. Through collaboration amongst the leaders in law enforcement and with oversight from Nevada Post, who would then report back to this body, I believe Senator Harris's hope for a best in practice statewide policy on use of force will be and can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grammis. I gave you a little bit more time there because I know we had a lot of support testimony. Didn't, don't go quite yet. I just, we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to give uh, members, and we could probably take a couple questions if anyone has one for Mr. Grammis. Um, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Yeager, Mr. Grammis, would you please spell your name for me? I, I can't read your name tag. I apologize. It's S-T-E-V-E-G-R-A-M-M-A-S. -M 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 thank you so much. Um, so thank you for your presentation. I understand uh, your concern. Um, but you said something um, earlier, and that was uh, that you all, this is the policy that you preach. Um, I think what the concern here is not the preach, but the practice. And so if Las Vegas MPD is the gold standard and there has been an effort by those involved to codify that standard, to make it consistent across the state, which we know is not the case, what is your concern and what is your opposition if the whole purpose is just to codify consistency across the state? Thank you, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. I believe my position is, is very similar to what it, it's stating. My position is, is that we let the leaders of law enforcement report to post and post implements these plans and this policy. Uh, by instituting things into law, everything has a potential to start leading down the, the road of penalties and enforcement and potentially people going to jail for violating maybe unknowingly laws. Uh, that's a concern for me as, as the leader of the PPA for not for people that are doing things that they shouldn't be, but sometimes pe doing things that they don't know that they shouldn't be. Um, but what I'd like to see, like I said, is to see the, the leaders in law enforcement working with folks to say, hey, we're gonna let you try and work this out. I know the community has had some concerns about things that go on with law enforcement and police work. You'd be naive to say that there's not. Um, but I think our, our group here has done a good job and I think they can continue to do a good job and I don't think it needs to be codified in law, steps on de-escalation and things like that. I think it's best left to them to adopt the policy, post to follow through on the policy and then bring it to you all, ma'am. Chair, follow up please. Thank you. So. It's okay for citizens who are not, don't have the benefit of all of the money that the police department has to do internal training, to be um, held accountable when they don't know a law and don't um, follow that law to the letter, and there are penalties for them, but not okay for there to be the possibility of a penalty for noncompliance to police departments that get millions of dollars each year from our tax dollars for training, not to have any possibility of being held accountable for stuff that they should know how to do. I'm, I'm kind of struggling with um, the, um, the situation here, so please help me. Sure, uh, Assemblywoman Armstrong again, thank you. Uh, so our officers are out there making split-second 
life or death decisions sometimes. Sometimes it's not life or death. Uh, sometimes it does involve physical force. Uh, they're out there trying to enforce the laws as set forth by the legislature, pretty much. Um, when they, when there's an, a, an, a law of some sort that, when we look at, when we look at de-escalation techniques, uh, there's a wide variety of ranges you could take that, that, well, you could have done this. Well, if it's not necessarily there, if I wasn't trained on it, because even in our policy, as in-depth as it is, policy does, can't capture everything. And the fear, unfortunately, when you can't capture everything, as Senator Harris and I talked prior to the hearing about a certain scenario, was, okay, maybe we don't think of everything. And, and I think that's what is important to have the leaders of the law enforcement agencies to sit down as the heads and talk about what policies that they can push out, train, effectively train, and, and we are always a proponent for more training, which I'm not sure we get enough of actual hands-on training, but uh, that they can push that out and say, this is what we need to do. There's, there's no ambiguity. Uh, putting, putting things into the law that can be vague uh, can start a slippery slope for folks. I don't know of any laws that are vague as far as the citizenry, not in the course of their scope and, duty, of their course and scope of duties for working. If they're out there, crimes have intent, that you have to have intent to commit crimes. Um, again, we talked prior to this hearing about the discharging of kinetic energy to the back, to the spine. Uh, well, center mass of what we're intending to, to fire any projectile is what we're trained to do. And part of that is the spine if the back is the target. And so now we have to look at potentially augmenting our shot of a beanbag round or a projectile to aim somewhere else. And now we're responsible for that round. And that's why we take that center mass theory is to make it an easier position for us. So I, I know I'm getting a little off topic, but our cops are always accountable. There are a lot of things that can happen in an incident that, whether knowingly or unknowingly, uh, I just would not want to see our officers getting prosecuted for doing things that maybe they are unknowingly or vague in what they're doing. I think the policies that we train on uh, are exactly what they should be getting. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gramis. appreciate that. I don't think we have additional questions at this time, and in the interest of time, we probably ought to move on, but thank you again for your testimony. Do we have anybody else here in Carson City who is in opposition to Senate Bill 212? Okay, I don't see anyone coming forward. I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom, but BPS, could we go to the phone lines to see if there are folks there who'd like to testify in opposition, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to testify in opposition of Senate Bill 212, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. We will begin with caller 1. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. This is Chuck Calloway, C-A-L-L-A-W-A-Y, representing the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Um, unfortunately, I'm here opposed to SB 212 today uh, due to the rules of committee. We did support the bill in the Senate, but unfortunately, um, as Senator Harris described, uh, sometimes when the draft language comes out, it does not accurately reflect all discussions that were had uh, in our stakeholder group meetings. Um, I do want to thank Senator Harris. Uh, she has been uh, the most um, engaged law or, uh, legislator this session with law enforcement, to my, in my belief. Uh, I've had number, numerous conversations with her going back to before the session even started. Um, as has been stated, much of what's in this bill reflects Metro's policy. Uh, but very quickly, I just wanted to state, um, as has already been mentioned, that um, we had handled hundreds of protests this last year and continue to handle protests on our agency. Uh, even as early as this week, uh, Monday or Tuesday of this week, there were some protests. 99% of those protests are peaceful and no problems occur and people are law abiding. But we did have a couple of protests last year where uh, violence occurred and property damage occurred. Officers were injured. And uh, on line 32 and 33, as was stated, 
Uh, it's just not practical in a deadly force situation to have to give a dispersal order. Uh, the word the word death should be removed from uh, that section of the bill. Um, I also share the concerns of giving a dispersal order in multiple languages. Um, we do give dispersal orders on our agency in English uh, and in Spanish when feasible and when it appears that um, the crowd may be uh, uh, Spanish speaking. Um, but uh, when a protest has turned uh, violent and a dispersal order needs to be given, uh, there's a lot of confusion and giving dispersal orders in multiple languages can add to that confusion. Uh, so that I need, I believe that needs to be narrowed down to English and Spanish. Um, also, uh, I just wanted to state that um, LVMPD's uh, use of force statistics are available online. Uh, you were given some statistics today that I encourage you to go to our website and look at our use of force data, uh, see for yourself what our statistics are. Uh, I won't get into the specific statistics today, but I encourage you to take a deep dive into some of these cases that you hear about and look at all the facts of the cases. Uh, and as a note, as a final note, um, it was stated by um, the individual who provided statistics that no data was collected from the Clark County Sheriff's Office, but data was collected from Metro. Las Vegas Metro Police Department has been consolidated since 1973, and we are the Clark County Sheriff's Office and the city police consolidated into one entity under uh, Sheriff Lombardo, who is uh, obviously elected by the voters of the county. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with Senator Harris moving forward so that I can once again be in support uh, of this important piece of legislation. And I thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Calloway. VPS, could we take the next caller in opposition, please? Next caller, put the last three digits of 668. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Troy Cromey, T-R-O-Y-C-E-K-R-U. MME, I'm the Vice Chairman of the Las Vegas Police Managers and Supervisors Association. I apologize for not being there in person. Unfortunately, I'm currently sitting in a doctor's office, so I will keep my comments brief. We are in opposition per committee rules. Several of the key pieces of our opposition were mentioned by members of the committee, as well as uh, Officer Gramis and Chuck Calloway. Uh, so again, I will keep my uh, comments at that, and thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Krumi. BPS, could we go to the next caller in opposition, please? Yes, caller with the last three digits of 887. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes to speak and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 887, please press star six to unmute and begin your testimony. Chairman Yeager, Vice Chair Wynn and members of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. My name is Corey Solferino, C-O-R-E-Y. S is in Sam, O-L, F is in Frank, E-R. I know, and I represent the Washoe County Sheriff's Office. I want to first thank Senator Harris for her collaboration and active engagement in these powerful topics we're trying to address in our state. Senator Harris is passionate about criminal justice reform and has actively engaged in conversations for months to learn more on the subject matter and make educated decisions on our industry's best practices. Pursuant to rules of committee, we are in opposition to SB 212 today. I do want to note for the record, we were in support on the Senate side and believe this to be a drafting error in the language. As several members have addressed and discussed this morning, Section 4, Subsection 7B3, page 8, lines 7 through 9, present a complicated requirement. In deadly force situations, an opportunity to give a dispersal order may not be practical nor reasonable given the circumstances. Just a few examples, hostage situations, active shooters, aggressive actions, which will result in substantial bodily harm or death if immediate action isn't taken. We believe that the removal of this language will place us back in a position of support. We appreciate Senator Harris's active collaboration with law enforcement and a willingness to understand the complexities of the law enforcement function and use of force scenarios. We wanna to continue to work with our state representatives to ensure Nevada is a state leader in best policies and practice. Chairman Yeager and committee members, thank you for this opportunity to speak before your committee today. And we are currently opposed. We hope to be able to move back to a position of support as we work hand in hand with Senator Harris to craft what we believe to be solid policy. And previous to my comments here today, I had the honor to present before this very committee back in February and present our 
use of force data and statistics that are available both on our website and in our end of year report, the state of the sheriff's office for the Washoe County Sheriff's Office. I encourage all legislators or community members comments about that to please reach out, contact us so we can continue this important dialogue. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Solferino. BPS, could we go to the next caller in opposition, please? Chair, there are no other callers in support at this time. And just to confirm, BPS, uh, no other callers in opposition of Senate Bill 212. Correct. My apologies, Chair. It's perfectly okay. It's Friday, and it's been a very, very long week, so we understand. Um, I'll close testimony in opposition, and we'll now go to testimony in the neutral position. Is there anybody here in the room with us in Carson City who'd like to offer neutral testimony? I don't see anyone coming forward. I don't believe we have anyone on the Zoom in neutral. BPS, could we go to the phone lines one last time to see if there's any neutral testimony there? Yes, thank you. For callers wishing to testify in neutral of Senate Bill 212, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And we will begin with caller with the last three digits of 384. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 384, please begin your testimony. Good morning to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you. This is Alexis Tusi, A-L-E-X-I-S, last name T-U-C-E-Y, Deputy Administrator with the Division of Child and Family Services, testifying in neutral for SB 212. Just wanting to... Uh, extend my thanks and appreciation for everyone's hard work on this particular bill and again just supporting in neutral for SB 212. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony Ms. Tusi. BPS are there additional callers in neutral? Chair there are no further callers in neutral at this time. Thank you so much, BPS. I'll close neutral testimony. I will now invite our star of the morning, Senator Harris, back up to the table to make any concluding remarks on Senate Bill 212. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Yeager. Uh, I appreciate uh, the committee's time. Um, I just want to uh, offer um, a commitment to the stakeholders that I will not accept any amendments uh, that stakeholders do not agree on uh, across the board. Um, we have been working very, very hard on this language, as I'm sure you all have heard, uh, and that is no offense to any uh, members on this committee. Um, I am more than open to bringing every suggestion that e each of you or anyone else has to the full group, um, but I have committed to them, uh, and I will remain true to my word that this is a collaborative process and, and we all need to get to a place uh, where everyone agrees or uh, the amendments will, will not be taken and I will not be proposing them uh, on my behalf. That is not to say that the bill is perfect uh, and that you all uh, may not have uh, some suggestions. I just want to uh, reiterate, reiterate my commitment to uh, the people that I've been working with for months and months that uh, we're going to lock this language down as, as a group. So um, thank you all so much uh, for your time and consideration and I will see you all again very soon. Thank you, Senator Harris. And, you know, I want to say thank you as well. I know we had some discussions, seems like years ago, but it was during the, the special session about use of force. And, you know, I think what, what we agreed on at that time was that the special session probably wasn't the best place to try to tackle this, this kind of issue. Uh, so I want to thank you for doing this uh, really hard work with a lot of interested parties over the last several months since the special session. Uh, we certainly appreciate it, and it was good to see you here this morning in Assembly Judiciary. I'm sure we'll see you again soon, and please have a great weekend. So I'll close the hearing committee on Senate Bill 212. That takes us to our last item on the agenda, which is, I'm sorry, Ms. Walsh, did you want to? Yes, one moment. So I'm going to I'm going to reopen Senate Bill 212. I'm sorry about that, Miss Walsh, and we'll have you come back up and make any concluding remarks before we move on.
Emily Walsh for the record. I just wanted to clarify based on uh, the statistic that the caller mentioned. Um, they are correct in that the uh, Las Vegas Metro and Clark County Sheriff's Department are combined. What I meant to say is that the uh, Nevada Highway Patrol officer involved deaths that occurred in Las Vegas are not included in those numbers. So as it stands, there were 70 uh, officer involved deaths that are attributed to the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Um, again, I just urge you to pass this bill. Data is very important and it can only help future legislators make better policy decisions as well. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Appreciate that. Sometimes with uh, only one table at the chair, <laughs> forget that we have multiple presenters. So uh, now I will close the hearing on Senate Bill 212. And again, that takes us to our last item on the agenda, which is public comment. By way of a reminder, we reserve up to 30 minutes at the end of each meeting for public comment. Public commenters will have up to two minutes to provide public comment. Public comment is a time to raise matters of a general nature within the jurisdiction of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. Is there anyone in the room with us this morning who would like to give public comment. If so, please come up to the table. I don't see anybody coming up to the table for public comment here in Carson City. BPS, could we go to the phone line to see if there's public comment there? Thank you, Chair. For callers wishing to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. We will begin with caller with the last three digits of 870. Caller, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Caller with the last three digits of 870, please begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Carol Luke, C-A-R-O-L-L-U-K-E. I am the biological mother of Thomas McHenry, who was shot and killed by Metropolitan Police Department on November 24, 2015. I am in support of the bills 131 and 212. And I believe, you know, the whether they're regularly in contact with the people or not, the law officers, you know, they need to wear these body cams. And they need to have them on any time they come into in a reaction because sometimes they're not a metro officer in uniform, but yet incidents happen. And as far as restraint chairs and things like that, you know, they do need to limit it because my, me, myself, I've been in trouble and I've seen the authorities abuse their authority, which they should not do because if not everybody is a criminal that goes around murdering and killing. We do have incidences with mental health and other things, you know, and they really need to use caution of who they interact with and take away from shooting, either, you know, killing them, shooting them in their knee, their arm or something, but there's no need for murdering our children. You know, um, I was at the Jorge Gomez's one and I heard the gunshots go off and it reminded me of the time my son's gunshots went off. And I don't want nobody else to hear gunshots go off because their child had his tablet in their hand and it was mistaken for a gun or anything else, you know. So I believe that the employees really need to be retrained in a lot of things to deal with mental health issues and and people who are on drugs and stuff that is not a threat to society because these people are some of them most of them are not to get they are handled with as a, a threat. And therefore, their lives are taken when they was not really in a threat. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment, Ms. Luke. BPS, could we take the next caller for public comment, please? Next caller with the last three digits of 556. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Anne Marie Grant, A N N E M A R I E G R A N T, sister of Thomas Mur Purdy, murdered by Reno Police in Washoe County Sheriff's Office, hogtied and asphyxiated to death during the mental health crisis. Thank you, Eric, Sarah, Tina, and Carol, for sharing your loved one's truth and advocating for change and hope nobody else will lose their, lose their life to police. We families are stronger together. I am empowered by our collective efforts as last week. Las Vegas Families United for Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Armstrong, for your questions regarding the last bill. 
data, I'd like to bring up Washoe County Dash, what they just recently put up, and they falsely stated that there were zero homicides at Washoe County Jail since the year 2000. I hope you all immediately recognize that is false data from Washoe Sheriff Darren Balaam. I pray after hearing me every day you realize that is simply false, and I believe intentional propaganda by Sheriff Balaam. It took the Reno Gazette calling them out on it for the dashboard to be changed. He listed the homicides on the first dashboard as excited delirium and zero homicides. Nico Smith was asphyxiated by Sergeant Corey Salferino, by the way. There should be a database to review complaints made against any officer in Nevada. Jorge Gomez was simply heading home to his vehicle after a dispersal order on June 1st. An officer had been shot and somebody was going to be held accountable that night. The hysteria created by the officer shooting that night amongst, amongst LVMPD is typical. LVMPD has shown us just how much they respect the people's right to peacefully assemble. Rubber bullets can be life-altering. Journalist Linda Torado permanently blinded in her left eye in Minnesota. Use of tear gas, as with all other chemical weapons, was prohibited by the Geneva Protocol of 1925. We can't use it in war, but we're using it against our community members. That's sad. It's sick. It's wrong. It needs to change. Policies are not law. And what do cops say to us that don't like it? Talk to your legislators. That is what your constituents are doing this session and us families who have personally lost a loved one to police. I just want to remind everyone last year, while the families of those killed by RPD, SPD, and Washoe County Sheriff's Office were honoring our loved ones during Reno Cop Watch annual event supporting families, Reno police literally stood across the street laughing as mothers were on the mic, pouring their heart out, crying to the community, wanting justice, just like George Floyd's family got, charges and jail time. What does that say about Reno police? Please support bills that promote transparency and accountability. If law enforcement opposed the bill, it's probably because it promotes accountability and transparency. You hear them all think they're doing gold standard work. I literally laughed out Ms. loud Grant, at that. Ms. If Grant, could you please wrap up? against the bill, I ask you to support it. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment, Ms. Grant. BPS, are there additional callers for public comment? Here, there are no other calls for public comment at this time. Thank you again, BPS, for helping us to manage the phones today and the broadcast as well. We appreciate you. I'll close public comment. Anything else from committee members this morning before we talk about next week? Okay, I don't see anything. I want to say how nice it was to have uh, uh, as full of a room as we're allowed to have at this point. So thank, uh, thank you to those in the audience who stuck with us through a pretty long morning. And committee, it's uh, indeed been, been a long week, so I won't say much other than provide you with the good news that we will not be having a Judiciary Committee meeting on Monday. And a second piece of good news is uh, we'll be starting at 9 o'clock on Tuesday. Um, we don't we don't have agendas out yet, but uh, the Monday agenda is out. That's a canceled meeting. The Tuesday agenda is not yet out, but it'll be a 9 o'clock start, and then we'll go from there. So um, everyone, please get some rest this weekend as we get ready for the last 30 days or so of the session. So have a great weekend, everyone. And with this behind us, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>